Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, November 2nd, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Aaron Kleinman, Director of Research for Future Now. How to watch the election returns. And with a definitive answer as to who will win. Well, maybe not on that last one. Friday smashes COVID infection rate in this country. Nearly 100,000 people infected on Friday. Meanwhile, Fauci has more or less left the building. Trump's talking now he'll fire him if he, well, maybe either way after the election. Meanwhile, Biden's polling holds firm. He's up in Pennsylvania. He's barely up in Arizona, up in Colorado, supposedly up in Florida. But who knows? Despite all that, Trump plans to call for an early victory on election night as legal armies assemble to fight in courts. The Supreme Court denied the Republican request to toss 130,000 ballots in Texas, in Harris County, Texas. Very blue area. Federal judge orders the post office to enforce extreme measures to deliver ballots. And the Kentucky State Police have a too much Hitler in their training program problem. And meanwhile, the Trump campaign has a, we keep branding our rally goers because we don't pay for buses problem. All this and more on today's program. Welcome uh, folks. It is a, a new week and a very consequen- a consequential week. I think uh, most of you know that tomorrow is uh, what we call the election day. Traditionally, it was the day where most people would go and vote. And this year, however, in many states, most people have already voted. Still anticipating almost almost half of the electorate to, to come out tomorrow, or at least the people who intend to vote. But we have smashed all sorts of records in terms of early votes across the country. It is really been stunning. Multiple states now, it appears, have beat their 2016 tally already. And they haven't even had in-person, or I should say, election day voting. And uh, so, I don't know, we, um, we're, we're gonna read off some polls today, but um, I, you know, I don't think that there is really, I think, you know, if uh, if Joe Biden wins in a landslide, we're going to hear a lot from pollsters and political scientists that this was quite obvious and that it was, all the numbers were there and we should have seen it. The stability of the polls for Joe Biden that haven't really changed substantially on a national level in two or three weeks, the 
disfavor in which Donald Trump is viewed, both in terms of just his general likability at this point, and also things like, how are you handling the major pandemic that we're dealing with? In many of these state polls that often broke away from Hillary Clinton in 2016, in many of them, not all of them, Joe Biden is over 50%. So Monmouth uh, today, for instance, we have a poll where Joe Biden's at 51.9%. Trump is at 43%. That's a nine-point advantage with a margin of error of two percentage points. That's a substantial lead. Um, but back when Hillary Clinton had a lead in Pennsylvania in 2016, I don't know if it was ever actually nine, to be honest with you, but she wasn't over 50%. So for instance, in North Carolina, Joe Biden has a 1% lead. It's a 2% margin of error. And they're both under 50%. Biden has 49.1. Trump has 48.4. Again, this is the Monmouth poll. And when you're under 50%, generally it has been the rule that Undecideds break for the challenger, but we don't know. And we also just don't know how many people's ballots will not be counted. We don't know in a state like Pennsylvania. We don't have a sense of this yet. We don't know if those ballots that will be sequestered because Republicans asked for any ballots that come in, they're postmarked, obviously, need to be postmarked by Election Day, but any ballots that come in or not counted by 8 p.m. would be separated so that presumably their Supreme Court would have a crack at, at saying those are those ballots are, are, are invalidated. There's also reports, though, in some of the biggest counties in Pennsylvania, they are uh, desperately trying to count these ballots uh, even early, although I think Pennsylvania state law, or at least the way that they've been running their elections in the past, they don't start counting the ballots until later. Florida, Arizona, North Carolina, they are counting their absentee ballots as they come in. Aaron Klein will walk us through a lot of this, uh, and he will do so uh, better than, than, I, than I can. So we'll save it for him. However, let's take a look at um, some of the uh, closing arguments, I guess you could say, of uh of the trump campaign um here he is donald trump in uh on the tarmac in hickory north carolina and we're going to be talking about and hopefully you've heard about the the blue mirage and the red mirage and then the blue shift and the red shift and this all has to do with the perception, and I'm not 100% sure it's true. We can talk to Aaron about this. The perception that the mail-in ballots and election day voting are polarized on a partisan basis. In other words, that, you, that the vast majority of mail-in ballots are from Democrats and the vast majority of election day ballots are going to be from Republicans. And it, it's starting to appear that that's not the case. In which case of this notion of a blue or red mirage, it's going to be a double mirage. The mirage may not be a mirage. But the idea is that Donald Trump now, it's been reported by Axios, is looking to declare victory on Tuesday night if it appears that he has more ballots that have been counted for him as opposed to just actual votes in the entirety of the election. But here he is on, uh, on Saturday, really starting to try and invalidate the idea that you could have a legally cast ballot, but if it takes too long to count it, it really shouldn't count because the anxiety of waiting to find out if I'm president, I guess, is just should be illegal. 
because it can only lead to one thing, and that's very bad. You know what that thing is. I think it's a very dangerous, terrible thing. And I think it's terrible when we can't know the results of an election the night of the election in a modern-day age of computer. I think it's a terrible thing. And I happen to think it was a terrible decision for our country made by the Supreme Court. I think it was a terrible decision for our country. And I think it's a very dangerous decision because you're going to have one or two or three states, depending on how it ends up, with their tabulating ballots. And the rest of the world is waiting to find out. And I think there's great danger to it. And I think a lot of fraud and misuse can take place. I think it's a terrible decision by the Supreme Court, a terrible decision. Now, I don't know if that's going to be changed because we're going to go in the night of, as soon as that election's over, we're going in with our lawyers. But we don't want to have Pennsylvania where you have a political governor, a very partisan guy, and we don't want to have other states like Nevada where you have the head of the, the Democratic clubhouse as your governor. We don't want to be in a position where he's allowed to every day watch ballots come in. Gee, if we could only find 10,000 more ballots. Because we're doing great in Nevada. We're doing great in Arizona. We're doing great all over. But if you take Nevada or Pennsylvania, and everyone knows what happens in Philadelphia. You, can, you don't have to say it. But I've read about it for years. And I don't think it's fair that we have to wait a long period of time after the election. If people wanted to get their ballots in, they should have gotten their ballots in long before that, a long time. They don't have to put their ballots in the same day. They could have put their ballots in a month ago. And we think it's a ridiculous decision. Thank you. Well, they actually couldn't get their ballots in a month ago. Uh, I don't. I don't know that. I mean, I think there are some states where maybe about a month ago they started to do early, um, early balloting, but you couldn't even get your absentee ballots uh, in, at least in New York, you couldn't even order them uh, until uh, fairly recently. And uh, I don't, he won't say what's going on in Philadelphia. Do you, does anybody have any idea what's going on in Philadelphia? It's like with cheesesteaks is what, what's happening in Philadelphia. It looks so bad. You don't even have to say it. <laughs> well, it's good. As long as nobody has to say it. But he is um, he's basically, you know, talking about what the strategy is. As soon as the uh, you know, we're, we're going to stop the election. If there's a moment where the vote count has us in the lead is essentially his plan. I mean, folks, does anybody I mean, the. It's very important for everybody to keep in mind what we've seen, not just in Florida in 2000, but even look at uh, the, the Kristen Sinema, uh, Martha McSally race. She thought she had won it on the night of the election, except for the problem is ballots get counted. And sometimes ballots come in late from areas that are strong for one candidate or another. And then two weeks later, she is not the senator from Arizona. I mean, these type of things happen all the time in our elections. It's just usually what happens is so many ballots have come in, they are breaking in a consistent way. We know the history of certain areas and the way that they vote. We know that those are the votes that have yet to come in. And so media outlets make projections, but it's not an official result and even if even if the candidates say I, I concede, you you can't. There's no like I concede, I I didn't win enough ballots, and then the next day or a week later, the secretary of the state it says, hey, well, no, actually we've counted the ballots, you won. Oh, but I said I lost, so we've got to stick with that. That, that that's not the way it works. And we're only now in this era starting to have elections, and by this era, I mean the past 20 years, that are so close that these issues start to arise, that we start to realize like we have a problem with the way that we vote in this country. We have a problem with disparate laws. We have a problem with this type of widespread disenfranchisement because 
our elections are getting closer. And now each vote is that much more meaningful. And so people need to be in that mentality. Hopefully it won't come down to that. And maybe Aaron will tell us about that when we get to him. But first, a couple of words from our sponsors. This is a, a total coincidence today. Yesterday, I was like, I'm going to, in the midst of all the anxiety, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to shave today just to make myself feel like I'm, I'm keeping it together. It's like a, the, that's the old move. When you're, when you're falling apart in the inside, I mean, there's just too much anxiety, right? So I decided to shave. Harry's has just come out with their sharpest blades ever. And here's the good news from Harry's. They're not going to charge you a dime more for their product improvements. Their new sharper blades are still as low as $2. We've been talking about Harry's on this program for, I don't know how many years now. Um, but you know the things I love about it. I love the the trimmer a blade head. That's important for me. I got some uh, nostril issues that have got to be there. I like the the classic quality of the um, the blade handle. The blades are smooth are are super sharp, but also the uh, glide helps me quite a bit. And of course, I don't like paying a lot of money, and it's super easy. They send them right to you. Their new blades are so sharp that in a study with guys shaving four times a week, the guys reported that with Harry's new blades, their eighth shave was as smooth as their first. Harry owns a German, uh, Harry's owns a German factory that's been honing razor blades for 100 years. They source their steel from Sweden, and they own the entire manufacturing process, allowing them to keep prices low. Harry's is convenient. Like I say, they deliver the blades directly to your door on a schedule with or without a subscription. They confidently stand by a 100% quality guarantee on harrys.com. Give Harry's sharpest blades ever a try. They have an amazing offer for our listeners. New U.S. customers can redeem a Harry's trial set at harrys.com slash majority report. You'll get a five blades of blade razor. That's with their new sharper blades. You get the weighted handle, foaming shave gel with aloe, and a travel cover to protect your blade when you're on the go. Just go to harrys.com slash majority report. One word, majority report. Redeem your trial offer today. Also, um, I've been hitting the um, liquid IV hard these days. So Halloween got a little out of hand for me. Um, I mean, it was just me basically sitting around with uh, with uh, my friend John, and we uh, we just we drank a little too much. But in the morning, what do I do? Liquid IV. And what am I doing every day on this program? One of my glasses filled with the energy multiplier. You know how it is when you're pushing your body, you're feeling run down, really important to take care of yourself with proper vitamins and nutrients, particularly these days. And that's why Liquid IV created the hydration multiplier plus immune support to maintain and strengthen your immune system. I've been trying to like, I've been, I've been, taking vitamins and doing all that kind of stuff. I'm actually doing a little bit of exercise these days because I'm doing my knee rehab. Not, it's not, you know, it's knee rehab exercise, but I'm doing all this stuff and it makes me feel good that, uh, that I'm also keeping myself hydrated. So, uh, many mornings I'll take the immune support. Then I turn around and I get the energy multiplier. That's the way I do it. That's the way I do it. They got great flavors too. The hydration multiplier plus immune support is a blend of vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and Wellmune in convenient single serving packets. C, D, and zinc, you probably know, they're great for your immune system. I take a lot of zinc when I get a cold. And so is Wellmune. It's a naturally sourced beta glucan that's proved to help strengthen your immune system. Plus each packet is bursting with fresh natural tangerine flavor. Tastes super good, folks. And with every purchase, Liquid IV donates a serving of Liquid IV to someone in need. In response to COVID-19, products are being uh, donated to hospitals, first responders, food banks, veterans, active military, everybody. Liquid IV's new hydration multiplier, uh, multiplier plus immune support is available at Walmart or 
you get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com. Use the code majority rep. It's majority rep at checkout. It's 25% off anything you order when you use the promo code majority rep at liquidiv.com. Get better hydration today. Liquidiv.com. Majority report promo code majority rep. Just majority rep. They don't want that art part. Majority rep. And then lastly, um, election time, big decisions being made. Sometimes you like to phrase it like we're hiring a new president. Well, if you're hiring, but not necessarily a president, hiring somebody for your small business or even your like, you know, medium sized business, I guess. It's, you know, that it's a huge pain in the butt. Thankfully, there's ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter does the work for you. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. First, what happens is you post a job on ZipRecruiter. It gets sent out to over 100 job sites with just one click. Then what happens is ZipRecruiter has this powerful matching technology. It finds people with the right skills and experience for your job and then actively invites them to apply to your job so you get qualified candidates fast. That's exactly what happened right on this pro, uh, uh, program. Brendan, who is sitting somewhere in uh, his some apartment somewhere. I haven't seen Brendan in six months, seven months. Still doing a, a crack job, though. We got, we got Brendan from uh, ZipRecruiter. Came in, bingo, bango. I interviewed probably maybe a dozen people. All of them were really good, but Brendan was just better. No due, no due respect. I mean, no, no misrespect. What, I don't even know what I'm saying. All due respect. All due respect to those people. But, I mean, that's the thing. It was a wealth of riches. Is that the way you say that? It's no wonder four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Folks, I've told you this before. The best time to, to, to start this process is when you don't need anybody. Small business people leave, give you two weeks notice. It's tricky. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. Head over there. Try it out. You may be stressed out about the election, but you will not be stressed out about hiring when you try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter, it's the smartest way to hire. Okay. Want to welcome to the program? Do we have Aaron? I don't know who that is. Oh, okay. Uh, joining us now, Aaron Kleinman, Director of Research for Future Now. Aaron, are you with us? Hey, Sam, I'm here. How are you doing? Good. I can't really see you. You know, oh, there you are. Um, there you, now they, I see you really dressed up for this. I appreciate that. Uh, now, you must be very busy these days, crunching numbers. And I know, look, we should tell people that... Um, that future now, you focus on the state of the states, as you call it. Yeah, and, we focus on state legislatures. And uh, so I want to talk about that, but you're also a numbers guy, and I'm sure that you, um, you have your way in which you're going to be uh, watching the election. And I'm also going to ask you to tell me the key counties again. I know I did okay. that a couple of weeks ago, but people forgot, and I lost a piece of paper. So uh, you're going to have to do that. But all right, you and I spoke, I don't know what it was, like uh, maybe – a month ago. Has anything changed? Let's talk just in terms of the national races first, and then we'll, we'll go down to the states if that's okay with you. Sounds has, good. Has anything changed? Has there been any significant change? I mean, because it seems to me like the dynamic has been pretty static. It has. No, you're right. Um, the uh, over, This has been the most stable presidential race um, in living memory. Um, I know that sound, for someone who lives through 2020, it's hard to imagine anything being stable. Um, but, you know, if you think of this election at the national level, it is a single issue election. And that issue is that Donald Trump is president. And people have pretty baked in views about that. Um, and so what we've been seeing, I mean, you know, I started looking at district level polling for our candidates in like June. And when we get those back, we see Biden top lines in them. And I remember in June looking at some of these and I'm like, oh, wow, he's a big in this district that Trump 
carried in 2016. All right. So wait, let me just be clear on what you're talking about. So if, when you say in district level, you're talking congressional districts, yes? Or, or uh, state legislative level district. Okay. So these are very, these are small uh, districts and they're specific ones that you guys have targeted because you know, they are like basically bellwethers. Yeah, they're going to be, you know, we knew that they would be the closest races in their chambers and determine who controls legislative chambers. So they tend to be um, in pretty, you know, the, especially because they tend to be gerrymandered. They tend to be in areas that Trump won disproportionately. And we keep getting back polls where, you know, even if Biden isn't ahead, he's improving on his, uh, on Clinton's 2016 performance. And it's a pretty common, you know, and it's just been happening since June. I can count on one hand the number of polls I've seen where Trump seems to actually be doing better in a district than he did in 2016. And so we've known for a while that um, Trump really hasn't grown his voting base um, while Democrats have. And so that means that heading into tomorrow and the days thereafter, um, we're, I think we are going to see, you know, keep, you know, a, a good democratic year. And again, I think, I'm hopeful that all the resources that we invested in ma making it so that these candidates can take advantage of a good Democratic year will bear fruit. And I'm hopeful that we can flip a lot of state legislative seats as well. Um, the so when you're looking at these uh, at, at these sort of uh, uh, swingy districts, is there any way I mean, because one of the things that I think that we hear in terms of the, there are two basically major factors, it seems to me that give at least lay people anxiety about the polling that we see. I mean, and all of this is obviously because in 2016, people were surprised. Um, but one is the idea that we have voter suppression. So how do we account for that when we look at these polls? And the second is I've seen reports of increased registration amongst Republicans versus Democrats, and particularly in some key states. So, um, you know, uh, maybe the Michigans and Wisconsin and, and Pennsylvania in particular, I think. Uh, what, how do you, as a pollster or someone who analyzes polls, I guess I should say, how do you, uh, how do you fold that into your analysis? So I'll tackle the registration stuff first. Uh, so voter registration um, actually, it's a lagging indicator. People tend to switch the parties that they're registered with after they've already started voting differently. And so if you actually look at past elections and you compare uh, changes in voter registration to uh, changes in the outcome, there is no correlation at all. So I just don't worry about, um, you know, it's like I care about new registrations. Yeah. Um, new registra registrations, aren't they? Well, not changes. Well, I mean, I no, so the, the numbers that people are seeing are net changes overall. And a lot of that is due to, especially like in a state like Pennsylvania, um, you know, if you look at 2015 there, for example, you have all these like 70% Trump counties that still voted Democratic at the local level. People were registered Democrats because they want to vote for, like in their local sheriff primary and stuff like that. And they've been doing that for 20 years. And so the Trump era has accelerated a lot of the movement away from democratic registration in traditionally conservative areas like that. Um, so that accounts for a lot of the changes is, is, are things like that. I mean, I think until recently, the majority of West Virginia voters were still registered Democrats. Um, and so I don't worry too much about voter registration. I, you know, I was a little, you know, it was a little unnerving to see new voter registration take a dip once COVID uh, uh, start hitting, but we've been seeing such good, especially early turnout from newly registered voters. I think that kind of cancels out. So I don't worry about that that much. No, we're voters. getting less new registrations, but a higher yield of those people. Who yeah, the, the people who uh, who are did register before COVID kind of uh, really sh shut things down um, have been turning out at rate, you know, at, at higher rates than we expected. So that I think it kind of cancels that out. And then on your first question, voter suppression. Um, allow me to identify the source of everyone's malcontents. And, and so you and I talked about the Powell memo before. This is the, this is the Powell, uh, this Lewis Powell memo wrote back yeah. in 1972, I think it was sort of outlining a response to, um, the emancipation uh, emancipation movements of uh, uh, that were were happening, like social emancipation movements, and also economic uh, the years of uh, the what they call the Great Compression, as as it were. So, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, 
two of the big prongs of the Powell memo and its blueprint for conservatives taking over government and enshrining minority rule were taking over the courts and taking over state legislatures. And then if you fast forward to 2020, you are seeing the fruit, it, it, the conservative movement um, planted those seeds and now it's bearing the fruit because it has right-wing judges saying uh, in some instances, the only people who can set laws around voting in states and we might throw out ballots um, is, um, are the state legislatures. Um, and so again, I wanna bring it back to state legislatures because you really wanna see Democrats make big gains in state legislatures in 2020. If you want your 2024 election night to be a lot smoother, you will be in a much better mood four years from now if Democrats flip a lot of state legislative seats because you are tackling the conservative movement at it, you know, you're tackling at the left, like this, this, the state legislatures are the foundation of the conservative movement. And if you can flip state legislatures, you can take that out. And that is, that will hopefully force them to have some type of reckoning and become a party somewhat interested in democracy again. I'm not going to hold my breath for that last part, but, uh, <laughs> but I would rather just not have them in a position to really make a choice about it. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this, it, it, because, um, you know, I, um, I, I've spent uh, a decent part of my adult life in, in, in rural, in rural areas, you know, where, where, uh, you know, the town, they're like, Hey, let's get bill to run for town supervisor and this and that. And all those people I know who are sitting on those, like uh, those type of, of boards, which are obviously not as competitive as, uh, you know, maybe a state rep or something like that, but they over the past couple of years have basically said like, I don't even want to get involved in that anymore because it's become so partisan. It used to be like, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, just because that's just the way it organized. And nobody seemed to care about that. Um, you know, in terms of the way that people voted, has it, has it for state reps, it's been moving that way for quite some time, but it seems we've got to be really at the peak. Like in other words, if I'm coming in to vote for Biden, am I, what is my propensity to say, I'm going D all the way down. Um, it's high. Uh, the number one predictor of how a Democratic state legislative candidate will perform is how the Democratic presidential candidate performs. Uh, that said, there are people who split tickets, and we see it um, really across the country. Um, you know, candidates can, um, if they can get their message out and kind of have their own, you know, if people are thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm going to vote for Trump, but, you know, I heard about this other guy and hey, you know, he has a lot of good ideas. And again, you know, we think it's centering on issues that's all about improving people's lives and things like increasing broadband access. That's a big deal, especially in rural areas. In Pennsylvania, they just expanded rural broadband. It's a pretty popular thing. Um, clean water, uh, regardless of your political affiliation, you don't want to drink poison. Um, you know, good jobs, like increasing wages, uh, you know, increasing union membership, you know, if, if you can kind of focus on those issues that really improve the lives of your constituents, then, you know, that is how you can kind of break through the din and try to get someone who might vote for Trump at the top of the ticket to still vote for a Democrat down at the bottom of the ticket. And so when we talk about, you know, what we're doing in state legislatures and raising money for them, um, what the money goes to is really basically just getting that message out, trying to target voters best you can to say, hey, you know, regardless of what you think about the presidential, this is, you know, this person stands for this at the state legislative level and you should vote for them. And then the presidential race in a district kind of defines the universe of what those, you know, of who you can get, basically. And so uh, one of your projects this year was to isolate different races in different and specific states. Mm -hmm. Um that we're going to turn a legislature or, or, or maybe get to a super majority or what, right? Do you want to tell us which ones those are? Yeah. So, um, you know, in future now we're involved in, I think, 13 states uh, in 2020, but uh, we focused our Give Smart program, which is really our small donor program um, in Arizona, Kansas, Montana, Michigan, North Carolina, New Hampshire, and Wisconsin. All right. Slow down for a second. Arizona, <laughs> Kansas, Montana, Michigan. North Carolina, New Hampshire, and Wisconsin. Okay, and and why those states? Uh, those are the states where we think small donors can make a bigger difference because of how campaign finance laws are structured, and where there's a real benefit into raising a lot of hard money. Um, yeah, and so that's that's the 
easiest answer to it. What's happening on the ground in terms of like, I mean, how, like in Arizona, how, what do we need to do for that state? Is that a situation where you're going to see the, like all three branches of the government go uh, Democrat or Democrat, or is it going to, is that a more defensive position? No. Uh, so in Arizona, where uh, Republicans hold a one seat majority in the House and a two seat majority in the Senate. And we think we can win both outright. Uh, one or two seats uh, gets you a tie in either chamber, basically. And the governor is a Republican um, who's had a pretty bad COVID response. So I think the hope is you flip the chamber in 2020. Um, you know, you can kind of stop the worst of it. You actually kind of force this guy to come to the table, maybe on things like the budget. And then in 2022, because he's screwed up the response of that, hope that you could beat him. And then you would get uh, unified control of the state government. And so Kansas, same, same deal? Kansas actually, uh, you, Kansas has a Democratic governor, but Republicans have super majorities in both chambers. Um, but, so we're just trying to break the super majorities and make so that they don't have a veto proof, uh, Republicans don't have a veto proof super majority. They've really, um, you know, she's ha- tried to have a good COVID response and Republicans and legislature just wouldn't let her do it. Um, and so we need to kind of allow her to push back basically. And she's very popular. People, think she's competent and a good governor and we just need to be able to allow her to govern and, you know, flipping the supermajority, bringing the supermajority in Kansas is a big part of that. Uh, they, um, uh, we should remind people that uh, Sam Brownback, uh, before he was, uh, he, he had the opportunity from, I think it was 20, 2012 maybe until uh, 2016 or 2018? 2010 to 2018. 2010 to 2018 to implement the, it was almost like year zero for Republicans in their implementation of Arthur Laffer's theory about cutting taxes. I mean, in many respects, Donald Trump followed uh, the same uh, uh, playbook and it was a disaster for Kansas. I mean, it was such a disaster that they took Sam Brown back and they made him ambassador to faith. I think it was. Yeah, they made a fake job. He implemented all the Chicago schools recommendations and it was really a disaster for the state. Um, and so, yeah, they, so they gave him a fake job to get him out of there and try to win the governorship. It's like if they'd set him up in a, in a satellite just to orbit the, the country so they couldn't do any interviews with anybody. I think that's what they would do. Uh, cause they were just afraid and Democrats did, I should say, did at least nationally a horrible job exploiting that huge disaster because it, it, um, really put to, uh, lie into bed, any controversy over the idea that you could lower taxes and increase revenue because of it. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And again, it gets back to the idea of when you're running for local government, it's all about you know improving lives. And in Kansas, it was literally like we're going to cut tax. You know, it was this ideological crusade. You know, this Ayn Rand ideal. And what it meant for people was that all of a sudden, some pretty good schools became terrible. Yeah. And it was a it was an absolute disaster for the state. And you basically there for a long time, you actually had a split between like a meaningful ideological split in the Republican Party. There were some, you know, Kansas has been, you know, just, you know, culturally a a Republican state forever. And so there were a lot of people who otherwise would probably be Democrats in other states who are Republicans. And so for a while there was that split. But, you know, again, as the Republican Party has become more extreme, a lot of those moderates have been pushed out. And so now you really like, you know, the lines are even starker. And so you're seeing more ideological sorting in Kansas than there had been in the past. Uh, in Montana, what's uh, what's the goal there? Montana, we're hoping to flip the state house and make progress in the state Senate. It's one of the longer shots, I think, there, because in Montana, the districts are so small, we were kind of hoping, like, oh, yeah, we can really send everyone door to door, COVID kind of. Uh, but the good news about Montana is um, even if you make progress, um, there are, there are some uh, Republicans there who will engage in a governing majority with Democrats on some like budget things and stuff. So even progress there is pretty good. And again, you're setting yourself up well, for, ideally for 2022. Uh, Montana has fair districts. All the population growth is occurring in areas that are increasing in Democratic vote strength. So, you know, even if it ends up being a two cycle lift, I'm ha- you know, and then ideally in 2022, Kansas will actually be able to go to door to door again, hopefully. Well, it's uh, hope springs eternal. Michigan. Michigan, uh, yeah, we're trying to uh, break the Republican majority in the state house. Um, I don't know how much people have been paying attention to uh, Michigan state politics, but um, they have some really extreme Republican legislators who show up at rallies with people who tried to kidnap the Democratic governor. Um, and, you know, 
they let people roam around the state capitol with, uh, armed with guns in the galleries to intimidate people. Um, you know, it, it's another state where I, you know, the COVID response looms large there. And, you know, ideally people are fed up. Democrats only need to fill up four seats to uh, win a state house majority there. It's really gerrymandered in Michigan. Um, so you have to win some kind of Republican areas, but we still think that we can do it. So four seats and then uh, who controls the Senate in Michigan? So the Senate isn't up in uh, 2020 in Michigan. Um, it's That's a Republican majority there, but um, at the very least um, you can prevent, uh, in Michigan actually, um, they there are some things that they could try to do without the governor. Um, basically, if you get enough signatures on uh, a veto override from like three 300,000 people in the state or something, um, both chambers can pass a law overriding the gubernatorial veto. And so they've been trying to use that on some of the COVID stuff. And uh, if you're able to flip the Michigan House, you can put a stop to that tactic. Uh, North Carolina. North Carolina, we're trying to flip the House and the Senate in North Carolina. Um, again, the maps aren't great, but um, we really are seeing, um, you know, North Carolina, the polling there, you know, we're hopeful. And then I would say when you're following election results on election night, uh, North Carolina, one of the first states to report, also one of the first states that'll report almost full uh, results. So if you want to look at uh, how some of our endorsees are doing, like uh, Francis Jackson in Cumberland County or Amy Steele in Cabarrus County, um, those are kind of good bellwethers for what the national mood would be, I think. Um, you know, because those, you know, those are some Republican leaning districts, but we have Democratic candidates there who, you know, if they're winning, that's a good sign for the rest of the country. What counties are those in North Carolina? So uh, those races specifically are in uh, Cumberland, uh, which is, you know, a traditionally Democratic area that um, I think Trump was kind of to, trying to gain inroads into. Um, I'm not sure that he has. And then Cabarrus is outside uh, Charlotte. It's traditionally a very conservative county, but they have, it's one of those places where you have a new subdivision going up every month and the people moving into those subdivisions aren't all Republicans. Um, and, but if, in North Carolina, if you're really looking for like the bellwether county for how things are going, I would say New Hanover County, which is uh, Wilmington. That tends to go with how the state votes. Um, we have kind of our model where we can run scenarios showing how it's, uh, you know, and so whenever we kind of run scenarios, New Hanover County always seems to reflect the statewide vote. So. Uh, that's New Han Wilmington area. Um, I would check that out. And then also Adam Erickson running a uh, state house race there too. See how he's doing as well. That's a, you know, it's a Republican leaning seat, but if he's doing well, it's a good sign. All right. That's good. Those are the type of things that we want to, to get out of you today to figure out what <laughs> we're looking at to tell what's happening. New Hampshire, Wisconsin. I mean, the, the level of anxiety. I, you know, I mean, you're a young man, but uh, so you haven't been uh, through too many of these. But the level of anxiety, I think, is just I, I've, I've never seen it so widespread. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, if you're on a plane that has a 95 percent chance of landing, you're still gripping the armrest. Yeah, I'd say. Don't tell me that. <laughs> We should say that uh, airplanes have a much higher rate. Yes, yes, it, it is uh, close to 100%. And this is, yeah, but, you know, I mean, again, you, there are, you know, a, a catastrophic voting uh, polling error or just mass disenfranchisement, um, either of those things, you know, they're certainly possible. And, you know, but if you're worried about them, um, you know, you, you can always try to do something productive. There's still about, um, let me see, about 30 hours left for people to go make calls and texts or even go door to door. What's happening with New Hampshire? New Hampshire, um, we're trying to basically Democrats flip the state Senate there in 2018 by only like a few hundred votes. And so they're trying to retain it. I feel good about that one. I would say New Hampshire is another early reporting state. If it looks like Democrats are losing in New Hampshire, that is a bad sign uh, for the rest of the night. Um, I would say, you know, um, New Hampshire reporting uh, doesn't always report out by county. Sometimes it's by uh, municipality, but um, Coos County in the north, um, if that's blue, that's a really good sign. And then Rockingham County, if uh, Trump's carrying Rockingham County, which is a lot of the uh, Boston commuter uh, bedroom communities, you know, that's a place that Biden should win um, because it's like, you know, it's typical suburban shifting toward Democrats. If he's not winning there, something's gone wrong. 
Uh, Those are these suburban uh, moderates that might be excited about the Republicans because of tax cuts, but are supposedly fed up with how. Yeah. And, and that gets to like if that's where like the systematic polling error would be would come into play, like because everything we have seen, not, you know, not, not just since 28, you know, not just since uh, Trump is elected, but really since 2018, it's like we think that the suburbs are trending Democratic and that's why our candidates like. John Morgan, he's one of our guys. He represents part of Rockingham County. Um, you know, he he represents a pretty conservative district, but it's been trending Democratic, and he's been able to hang on there. If he's losing, I get a little nervous because um, you know that's the type of area, the bedroom communities of Boston, formerly anti-tax, but now really kind of repulsed by Trump. Those are areas of the Democrats that we're basically counting on them to be able to flip. So if they're not flipping that, I get nervous. Uh, all right. So Wisconsin, what are we looking for there? So Wisconsin, it, um, you know, that is a, an interesting case because they've, you know, I, I think people know they've had one of the worst COVID outbreaks of anyone. Um, and when that happened, um, the, the state we think is really moving away from Republicans quickly. We think it's really angry at kind of there, especially the state legislature basically refused to do, they refused to go into session to do anything to address COVID. Um, and so- Primary. This, it seems what? like the 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 primary election was sort of the inflection point for that. I just remember that that one um, Republican. I don't know if he was the leader of the House or something. He was like, "It's perfectly safe out here." And as you pull back on the camera, he is wearing like a hazmat suit. Yes, like oven. So his and his name is Robin Voss. Um, he represents a pretty Republican district in normal circumstances, but we actually think that we might be able to knock him out. That would be like, you know, it's like, I don't know if we can knock out Mitch McConnell. We can knock out the Mitch McConnell of Wisconsin. So check out, uh, I think it's a uh, district, I think it's 63, sorry, 62, yeah, 63, uh, House District 63 in Wisconsin. Check it out. Um, and normally very Republican district, like if he wins, it's not necessarily, good, but like that would be a real cherry on top. This guy has prevented the Wisconsin legislature from doing anything, anything to address the COVID epidemic. Um, and you can see it's running and just, you know, people are partisan. It's part of like, it's really wrapped up in their identities. But when something like COVID is just raging, you know, it, it's your vote can sometimes transcend that kind of affiliation a little bit. Um, and so if you're seeing him go down and it's unclear, it might be late in the night uh, when that happens. So you, you might have a pretty good idea of how the rest of the election is going, but it'll be, you know, it'd be a really hopeful sign that, you know, you can only go so far. You can only bank on tribalism so much and that people are going to look to public officials to do things that will address the things that are important to them, like stopping a pandemic. That feels like low hanging fruit in terms of what you think you should be doing if you are a government official. But um, I guess that is uh, in certain quarters, that's controversial. All right. So um, those are the state houses races that we're going to be looking at the, your top nine. I know you got a couple more over on the state of the states um, at uh, Future Now. But let so you've given us in North Carolina, look to Cumberland County, Cabarrus County uh, and Hanover County is a big bellwether. Well, New Hanover is the biggest bellwether. I would say look at the margins in Cumberland and uh, Cabarrus. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Cabarrus, you really, I think, you know, you, you basically, if uh, you want to make sure that Trump's definitely below uh, 60 in Cabarrus, I think that that'd be a pretty good sign. And then, you know, you definitely don't want to see him doing better in uh, uh, Cumberland County. Oh, just let me pull up my uh, trusty simulator here so i can you don't have it. it memorized i don't have them quite memorized but uh, really? wow i don't have the exact but i do know new hanover if, if biden's if biden's carrying that that's a good sign for the night uh, yeah so uh cabarrus county definitely you want to see trump under 60 if trump's at like 55 there it's, it's a great sign okay. um and then cumberland similarly you want to see you know Ideally, Biden would be getting around 60 there. If he's a little below 60, that's fine. If Biden's going down to like 55 there, that's a bit of a red siren for at least North Carolina. Okay, so that's North Carolina, New Hampshire. What, uh, what else? What, like, what, what's the first like, time in the evening where you're going to be like, I need to check in on this. This is the one I keep refreshing my page on. And when this tells me this, 
then I know that. Yeah. So, I mean, part of the problem that this year is because we don't really know as well how things are going to report out. It's a little tougher to say it. And so, and just in general, like there'll be a lot of bad information flying around. Um, so you have to be careful, but you know, you look at the earliest reporting states. Um, if you really want to dig deep, you could, you know, I, Indiana and Kentucky are reporting first. I mean, you can always in Indiana, I mean, you know, we all know that Joe Donnelly uh, lost there in 2018, but if Biden's coming close to the Joe Donnelly numbers, that's a great sign for him overall. Uh, so if Biden's coming close to even, just even coming close to the Joe Donnelly numbers. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, if I think back to 2016 and what I went through, I know it's, it's difficult to revisit, but I remember when Indiana and Kentucky first came in, I was like, wow, Trump's getting amazing margin in these rural areas. If he can keep that up nationwide, imagine what would happen. And then it, it, it did happen. It, um, he had these outsides. And so, but at the same time, we're working with incomplete information. We're not sure, um, you know, at, even at the state and county level, you're not entirely sure who's reporting what, when, and like what's outstanding. And there, you know, we all know about there's potential, uh, you know, the blue mirage or red mirage, depending right. on the state and what's reporting out. All so caveats. I give the caveats, you give the numbers. That's the way. It all right. Okay. So right. you're giving out all the caveats. Uh, so another state that reports are. Kentucky, I'm looking at if Biden's numbers are beating uh, Clinton numbers in Kentucky or what? I mean, yeah. I mean, the thing that people kind of forget about this election is Biden only has to do a little better than Clinton to win. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you, you look to see if, you know, if Trump's improving over 2016 anyway, um, you know, and it goes back, you know, I, like I said, I've been looking at these district level polls since June and I really haven't seen that happen very much. So, you know, that's a sign that something is amiss if Trump's like consistently outperforming his numbers again with all those caveats that we give. Okay. Um, and then right. the next group of states to report would be like, um, Ohio and Virginia, I know, are in that. And so we were in Virginia in 2019. And so there are two areas that I would look to hopefully be shifting toward uh, Biden. And that would be uh, Chesterfield County and Virginia Beach. So hopefully those areas are, um, you know, if you want to see him winning those, that would be a pretty good sign. But also one thing with Virginia is because Tim Kaine was on the ticket in 2016, political science literature does indicate that there is a bit of a home state boost. So it's actually not fatal if they're not really improving on Virginia numbers that much. Ohio, on the other hand, seems to be doing a lot better in 2020 than 2016. So, um, you know, Trumbull County, which is on the border with Pennsylvania, um, a traditionally Democratic area that um, uh, went for Trump, I, you'd want to see that bounce back. Um, so that would be a, a heartening sign. If not, it's a little worrisome. Okay. And then um, and if you want to see and if you want to see Biden actually carry Ohio, which they certainly seem to think is possible. Uh, Wood and Portage counties, which are kind of two, they're a mixture of like colleges, suburbs, and farmlands. So they're really kind of like microcosms. Portage, you said? Portage and Wood. Okay. Okay. Wow. These are good. So we now have like a, a real uh, viewing guide. And again, we're not going to know. We can't know these numbers are not are not hard and fast, and they're going to be dynamic. But it's we're looking for trends. If all of these places go in the direction, it seems by the time we get to like seven thirty eight p.m. at night, we're going to be feeling pretty good about it, right? It's possible. Um, you know, I mean, I think North Carolina Carolina will report a big batch out at seven thirty, um, and so that should tell us a lot. Um, and so, what are we yeah. looking for in North Carolina? Again, it's New Hanover County if you want your presidential bellwether. And then Florida also reports out pretty quickly, pretty early. And uh, Seminole County, which is a traditionally Republican suburban county, we're in. Uh, we also got our candidates Tracy Kagan and Pasha Baker there that we're backing, and so keep an eye on them. But you know, Seminole County, if Biden can flip Seminole County, that's a pretty good sign for Florida. Um, also, uh, Pinellas and uh, Duval counties as well. I, you know, they, those tend to be bellwethers. And that's it. So those are the, all the counties that you're going to be looking at, right? Well, I'm looking at uh, about 400 state legislative races, hmm. uh, trying to herd cats, trying to figure out what's going on with those. So I'll be in uh, my little bunker. But uh, yeah, so I, I, on, uh, on election night, I, I, I'm i going to be pretty busy, but um, we'll be uh, shouting out all the candidates who uh, win our important races over at Future Now USA. So that'll be a way for uh, 
people to keep track on Twitter. So follow you on your Twitter. Are you not going to be doing it on your own? Uh, on your- I'm gonna, I got 400 uh, state legislative races. I got to track. I'm going to be a busy man. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to uh, weigh in on Twitter that much, but uh, our- uh, How do you physically do that? Do you just open up your, you have like three uh, monitors and you have tabs open on every one and you're just recycling, re- refreshing each one of these things? I have a lot of help too. We have, uh, you know, some very, uh, I have some great coworkers. Um, and we also have a great team of volunteers that we have, uh, that will be helping us out as well. And yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of just trying to jump from tab to tab, seeing what's going on, trying to figure out, you know, what the story is from all this, because together all the numbers should tell a story and we'll start learning what that story is, uh, tomorrow night. We'll have a fuller picture of it a week from then. And even fuller picture kind of, as we go out and elections get certified and we try to see what happened. And do you also have a mechanism, like if there's any voting irregularities that they're dealing with there? Um, usually some, uh, I think it's uh, if someone uh, on a campaign or, or in that state will flag something to us. It's like, this looks really weird. Uh, I'll take this with a grain of salt. We're going to try to figure out what's going on. Well, uh, Aaron Kleiman, uh, Director of Research, Future Now and the Future Now Fund. Uh, folks can find it over at futurenow.org. Uh, and your State of the States uh, report, still one of my favorite documents. Oh, we'll uh, see how right I was. We will. We will. And I will let you know about it, too. All right, Sam. Sounds good. Good morning, Sarah. All right. Thanks for having me, Sam. All right, folks. Quick break. Back in just a minute. We're back, uh, folks. This is a uh, if you are, find yourself by having any questions or confusion or any problems that you encounter in your uh, voting, like if there's crazy long lines, if there are polling places that are closing, if there are problems with locations, if there's any intimidation, take down this uh, this number. This is the Democratic Voter Hotline. It is 833-336-8683. That's 833-336-8683. And if you need text-based instead of a phone, you can text the word ACCESS, A-C-C-E-S-S, to the number 43367. And uh, in Espanol... It's 866-296-8686. Again, for Spanish speakers, 866-296-8686. We'll put that on our uh, podcast and uh, uh, show description. That is the Democratic Voter Assistance Hotline. Uh, you can call if you're uh, a Republican uh, and, you know, but, you know, to talk about uh, how you see other maybe other Republicans intimidating people from voting. I don't know how that would work out, but um, check that out. We will, again, put that in our uh, descriptions today and you can find it at majority.fm. So here is um, the, the, the closing argument from the Trump campaign. I think they're still saying Sleepy Joe. I'm not sure. They are... Um, they're still uh, convinced about that Hunter Biden has like multiple uh, laptops, apparently. Uh, but none of that seems to be working very well. So what they're going for is we're going to try and play the angle of when the votes come in. Here is Jason Miller on ABC This Week echoing what Donald Trump has been saying and what that Axios report was that, that Trump is going to try and declare himself the winner if it's even remotely close on election night. And here's uh, Jason Miller trying to already set the frame. Listen to this. 
And the one final thing, George, if you speak with many smart Democrats, they believe that President Trump will be ahead on election night, probably getting 280 electoral somewhere in that range. And then they're going to try to steal it back after the election. We believe that we will be over 290 electoral votes on election night. So no matter what they try to do, what kind of hijinks or lawsuits or whatever kind of nonsense they try to pull off, we're still going to have enough electoral votes to get President Trump so, reelected. So basically, for, for you're saying that the president needs to have a clean sweep of all the states in the Sun Belt that he won back in 2016, Arizona, Georgia, Florida, Texas, North Carolina. I, I said I believe that we're going to win all of them. They're now, the thing that's interesting here is that they're claiming that they will have these electoral votes based upon vote tallies that are not complete. So the implication is here that they're going to try that, that by continuing to count the ballots, Democrats are going to be attempting to steal the election. That's the, the dynamic that they're going for here, and they're trying to create this um, they're trying to create this narrative. Donald Trump is out there talking about going to keep finding ballots and more ballots are going to come in. And I want to remind people of, of two things. One, the idea, well, one is that Paul Ryan, who was considered one of the supposed normal Republicans or one of the moderate Republicans or the responsible Republicans, who was allowed to go on every television show and, and, and speak as if he... When Donald Trump started talking about the ballots coming in from California, because you'll recall, in California, it takes weeks to get the final tally in. Weeks, because they're counting so many ballots. Paul Ryan was going out there and saying, this is very suspicious, what's going on? creating this sense of you cannot trust the idea that it would take some time for people to count some ballots. And the other thing is, is not only is, you know, Donald Trump is not somehow inconsistent or some type of uh, aberration in terms of the uh, Republican Party. You had Paul Ryan supporting that idea, and you've had Republicans talking about suppressing the vote since 1980. Paul Weirich was getting in front of uh, what would ultimately become the moral majority and saying, we want less votes. That's how we get leverage. Weirich became the co-founder of the Heritage Foundation, of the American Legislative Exchange Council. He coined the phrase moral majority. This is a Republican tradition. We'll see you tomorrow. Make sure you go vote. All right. And for those of you sticking around, oh, just a reminder, uh, tomorrow is our 10-year anniversary for this program. And uh, joining me after the first hour for the first time, making her debut appearance on the program as a uh, member of the team, as it were, Emma Viglin will be here. And we're actually going to be in studio together. We're going to do this. Not going to, I'm not going to do it too often, but occasionally. But I am, I am looking as I speak uh, over my shoulder at the beginnings of, and I've got to, uh, I've got to do some, some refining of plastic tarp. It looks like there's, it looks like a construction site. The office is a complete disaster. It's a complete disaster in here. Because it's only been me in here, like ripping apart boxes and setting up new stuff. And it's such a shame, too, because we had such a beautiful sort of like set, you know, and now it's just sort of like this strange Franken, Franken set. Franken set? Folks, don't forget, uh, is your support that makes this uh, show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, tomorrow, you know, if we had... If, if I had a better sense of these things, we would have all sorts of like hijinks planned for tomorrow. I don't know. I guess, you know, the, the, the most, the most foresight I've ever, ever shown. And it really wasn't just, it wasn't me. It was more Brendan, but uh, I, I actually answered him when he asked me, uh, was to, we reserved a venue almost a year ago 
for tomorrow that we were going to use. It was going to be like a 12 hour extravaganza. We were going to be in this big, uh, we were going to be maybe music and I mean, it would have been crazy. Right. And, um, Oh, right. Okay. Oh, we got Ben. Yep. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Um, all right. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's bring, uh, Ben Wickler on, uh, folks, the, uh, chairman of the Wisconsin democratic party. Is, ben, is that, can you hear me? Is that the, uh, is that his specific, do you call yourself the chairman of the democratic party in Wisconsin? Yes, uh, the Democratic Party of Wisconsin chair. I am switching webcams for maximum color correction effects. There you go. Boom. There we go. That's better. Oh, that is impressive. So you've got like multiple camera angles? I head? have an external monitor with a crappy cheap webcam. And then I have my laptop that has the better looking one. And so this is my, this is my Sam Cedar webcam. You, you know what I'm saying? I, I bring out the very best in webcam technology when I'm talking to you. Well, I appreciate that. I was just going over that uh, tomorrow is the 10 year anniversary of this iteration of the program, if you can believe it. And uh, you um, back when we were in that uh, little crappy closet, uh, you came by to help us out at one point, too. I don't know if I remember vividly. I remember. And then I remember you. Well, are you thinking of that room, the windowless room that was yes. like a big cube? Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from your setup. That became the inspiration for my own uh, cube like uh studio for my back in my podcasting days well uh, i'm sorry you didn't have a chance to see this new studio because it looks uh it's much nicer of course it was nicer now it's just like there's plastic draped everywhere and it doesn't uh you know it's all it's all strange um so ben uh wisconsin there's a there's a lot riding on it but i have to say like uh we were just talking to aaron Kleiman from uh from future now and it feels like wisconsin has been, and you've done an amazing job uh, uh, there uh, in, in your role. I mean, the, the 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 fundraising and just the energy around there, and particularly with the with the primary. It seems like the primary was a huge inflection point and like a pivot point for really the past decade. I mean, in to almost I guess it was nine years ago. I was out in Madison uh, covering the the protests. Right when this was a like it was the first thing we did three months into the show and everything went sideways uh with scott walker the there was a failure to recall him and it was a failure to sort of turn that energy into voting people out and it, and it feels like the primary this year because of the the republicans basically saying to wisconsinites like yeah we don't care about your health um that seem to change everything is is that oh you tell me so i think that the untold story of wisconsin is a progressive movement that republicans tried to smash with a sledgehammer for a decade that refused to break this is you know they went after unions they dissected them hammer and tong then they uh went after young people they went after black wisconsinites with these insanely harsh voter id laws and then moving dmvs out of city centers they everything they could do, rewriting campaign finance laws, making it so so gerrymandered that Democrats could win 54% of the assembly vote in 2018. And re Republicans uh, got 64 of the legislative seats, uh, or 63 of them, I should say. This, this kind of massive assault on democracy. And people kept working and organizing. And I, th I think you saw the result of that in the spring um, but that wave, I mean, it, it carried through in 2018, where despite all of that, uh, Wisconsin came out with Democrats winning every statewide office for the first time since 1982. And that energy is continuing to this moment. I mean, we have thousands and thousands of people making phone calls to voters right now. And, and that has been true day after day after day. And the kind of organizing energy, the way that grassroots organizations are are pouring in their work. And then I'm so proud of what our party activists have been able to do in Wisconsin um, on the, you know, on the official integrated with the Biden campaign operation, which is uh, in every corner of the state. There's this national storyline that red areas get redder, blue areas get bluer, but we're seeing movement in our direction in every region of Wisconsin. And that's, you know, contrary to the script, 
but it reflects the fact that people are just like pulling out all the stops around the clock. So what are the um, what what are the big races? I mean, is it that you're? I mean, obviously the presidential race, right? At Wisconsin, pretty important in that regard. Significant, yes. I understand. Uh, last time it didn't work out as well, uh, but there's. I mean, it seems to me that there's like two different things that are going on. Like one, uh, I know you got like um, some uh, some maybe some state ha- state house races that you're looking at. And also on some level, people are starting to talk about Ron Johnson, like that maybe this is a good way to sort of create um, an infrastructure in which to take him on. What, what, so what, aside from Joe Biden coming out the victor, and hopefully it will be really nice if you guys could wrap this up early in the evening, but um, what else is on the ballot? Like I know in the, in the, during the primary, there was a big uh, Supreme Court race still unbalanced court, at least in terms of uh, progressives. I know they don't have it Republican or Democrat there, but but what what else is on the docket for you guys? Like what like when you have your big board, because I know you have a big board in there. Um, you what, can see I've got the Wisconsin Gerrymandering Museum just, right here behind I mean, me. Well enough that, I mean, I've told this story a million times before. When I've walked down, I saw like the you as a producer uh, back in the days, you you like big boards and uh, and keep it organized. So I know there's a, I know there's a big whiteboard in there somewhere. What What is on that board? So fundamentally, the, the, the most significant battlegrounds are these state legislative races and the presidency. We also have congressional races across the state. There's five Republican held seats. There's one Democratic seat. Republicans are coming after hard. I think we're going to hold them off. Um, and then there are local races around the state. Um, but the, the state legislature is really the, the crux of it. Republicans gerrymandered our state, as I was saying, super intensely. And their goal this year was to get super majorities in both the state assembly and the state senate. And they talked to press about that. They pitched donors about that. They have like multiple dark money groups. So if you watch a you know show on cable TV in the Milwaukee suburbs, there might be four different attack ads from different organizations in the same commercial block going after Dems. And their, their big goal was to get enough power to re-gerrymander the state for another decade, despite Governor Evers, a Democrat, being in the governor's mansion. And that goal looked pretty frighteningly tenable a few months ago. At this point, I'm feeling, you know, knock on all available wood, but I'm feeling really good about beating them back and actually flipping Republican held seats in, in, you know, not everywhere, but there's a bunch where we're in competition, especially around Milwaukee, but in multiple regions of the state, closer to Dane County, Northeastern Wisconsin, Western Wisconsin, like we're fighting really hard in a whole lot of different races that weren't supposed to be on the map. And you know, I will be watching that like a hawk. I will also say our, our plan for this year was spelled out WISCO. So was, the W was win the spring election, use that as a dress rehearsal for the fall. So that's what you're talking about with the state Supreme Court race on April 7th, where the GOP forced in-person voting right as the pandemic was starting. Uh, and we mobilized, you know, roughly a million absentee ballots in that election, which had, you know, four times what anyone had ever seen. And the we there is the big we of the, the party, the grassroots organizations, unions, all the people who were working on that. Um, won that that fight by 10 percentage points. Um, so W and Wisco would win the spring. I and Wisco was inspire, recruit, train thousands of volunteers during our national convention, which was in Milwaukee in some sense. It was virtual, but we held this massive virtual training. The S is for save the veto, stop the super majorities. The C is cancel Trump's second inaugural, which is the uh, presidential big kahuna. And then the O is organized for the long term, including stop Ron Johnson, make sure he is... Uh, ends his Senate career in 2022, reelect our governor, lieutenant governor, treasurer, uh, state attorney general, um, fight to flip the legis- both chambers of the legislature because we'll have new maps after 2020, after the census, the US House races, like build the infrastructure for year round organizing and long-term um, strength so that we don't have a 2022 that looks like 2010 when we lost everything after having a blue trifecta. So, all right, how do, I mean, I just want to just go back to that, that one thing about, you know, the legislature and the maps and this and that. I, I, I when we talk about the, like a, a, a failure of, or a, an assault on democracy, Wisconsin, the Wisconsin state house is one of the, like the prime examples in the country. I mean, you already mentioned this fact, but I've, I've stated on this program, maybe three times, uh, you know, maybe once a week, the idea that, 54% of the people went in and voted for a Democrat 
And yet, they have 63%, the Republicans won 63%, like, people need to, like, sit back and sort of figure out how that's even possible. And it sounds like it's impossible, but it's just that the the way that the things have been redistricting people came in they voted you know more than five out of ten times for the democrat and yet more than six out of ten uh um the seats went to the republicans so how do you fix that i mean how do you if you how do you break that sort of self-fulfilling that feedback loop there because once they're in a position of 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 getting an inordinate amount they're no longer accountable to the voters essentially they have the ability to draw their own maps i mean how do you break that cycle so you can see the strength of that cycle in 2018 uh, after the whole blue wave came in um, we had not flipped a single state assembly seat in the in the entire period since the new maps were drawn and in 2018 we won one of them by 132 votes that. So in that year when we had the 54% vote for state assembly, that's how just incredibly finely do the, the maps are drawn. They cut sometimes through the middle of a block, through people's backyards or the median in the, in the middle of the street. And that seat, the Republicans targeted with everything they had to try to take it back, as well as to try to take back um, several of the more rural districts held by Democrats that had gone blue. And we built this uh, plan called Save the Veto with Governor Evers and with our state legislative caucuses, where we went out and just raised money and worked with some of the best ad people and you know digital people to build these big plans, almost like congressional races for these state legislative seats that Republicans were trying to grab. And eventually, I mean, I think we've pretty much scared them out of several of the races that they thought they were gonna be really competitive in. And then in the last couple of months, we're now on offense in a bunch of races that Republicans didn't expect to have to try to defend. But all of that gets us to the point it will have next year when we actually have the new census and then we can draw new legislative maps. Because we have the governor, the governor can uh, veto gerrymandered maps when Republicans try to do it again, unless they get super majorities. We can veto those maps. Uh, Republicans can try to go to state court because we won the spring Supreme Court election. Uh, that at least provides some buffer against the most extreme kinds of judicial overrides Republicans might try to do. And there's one justice who sort of swings back and forth on the straight state Supreme Court a bit. So I think we have a path to getting better maps by 2022. And that is the, the prime directive. That is the key um, to restoring democracy in the state. As long as we have these like outrageously drawn maps, Republicans only worry about primary elections. They only look at threats from their right. And the only question that they have to answer is, have they made the Republican leader, Robin Voss, happy? Because he controls the spigots of their funding through their uh, Republican you know, assembly caucus, the equivalent of like Mitch McConnell's operation. And so he rules with an iron fist and he can get them to do things that would be incredibly unpopular because we pulled in their districts. We know their constituents don't like it. They In Wisconsin, they haven't passed a single bill in the last six months in the midst of this giant upswing in coronavirus. What they have done is sued to get to remove our governor's ability to do things like stay at home orders unless the legislature passes a rule. And so they like if you look at why Wisconsin has such an explosive coronavirus outbreak, look at our state legislative Republicans. They grabbed the power uh, that was built on using the power grab they did after Evers was elected, where they moved rulemaking authority to the state legislature and away from the governor. And then they use that to torpedo our coronavirus control. So, I mean, that there's people are furious with them as a result. Their public support is in the in the toilet, uh, but we have to turn that into votes in this final day. Well, I, I guess say, I mean, I'm encouraged just by the fact that people are reacting to that type of, frankly, insanity. It would be really discouraging if people like didn't notice. Uh, so it's 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 encouraging that they're noticing. All right. So if people want to help out in in your effort, what do they got to do? Uh, it, the, I mean, is there anything left to be done for the next 24 hours? Absolutely. Get on the phone. After you, sh you should finish watching this episode of The Majority Report with Sam Cedar, and then you should go to wisdems.org slash phone bank. Wisdems.org slash phone bank. We are running phone banks, you know, morning till night. And those calls are totally critical. At this point, we are telling people who have absentee ballots, there's still like 175,000 of them who haven't returned them. Bring them to a Dropbox, bring them to your clerk's office. And then for folks who haven't voted yet, you can go to the polls tomorrow. So much has been learned since this spring. It will be safe tomorrow. There will be safeguards in place. There's plexiglass. There's masks they'll hand out to people when they go in. 
So go and cast your ballot. And in Wisconsin, you can same day register. So if, you know, if you're not registered, this is the one thing Republicans uh, failed to dismantle. You can still bring your proof of residence and your ID and go to the polls, register to vote, cast your ballot on the same day. And it's all hands on deck. Wisconsin, you know, the, the polling looks good. And we have this history of polling uh, leads collapsing very rapidly at the end. And so we were taking nothing for granted in the last stretch. All right, what's that uh, address again? W-I-S-D-E-M-S, wisdems.org slash phone bank. And I will say that the, the reason why, um, the reason why the Koch brothers and the uh, AFP and uh, Scott Walker started with Wisconsin, I think, in this like sort of latest iteration of their assault on democracy was because of the history that Wisconsin had in the progressive movement in terms of unions and, and, and whatnot. And I think they felt like if we can do it here, we can do it anywhere. And they did roll out a lot of stuff through ALEC that they had basically piloted in Wisconsin. You know, the the whole notion of, of you know, so-called right to work uh, states and uh, on, a, on a national level, the the Janus ruling in many respects, a lot of that was born in, in, in uh, that that pilot program, if you will, by Scott Walker in Wisconsin. So to take back Wisconsin, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's a lot of it's already already taken place. Uh, ben Wickler, thanks so much for showing up today. Good luck. Thank you, Sam. Good luck to all of us. And I hope every one of your viewers gets some nice conversations with Wisconsin voters in the next uh, 36 hours. Right. You can talk about cheese and stuff like that. Really oh, yeah, that's great. All right, Ben. Bye. Appreciate it. All right, folks, we're going to head into the fun half. Uh, we will put uh, a link to uh, wisdoms, uh, dot org there, too. So check that out. Um, don't forget, you can support this program by becoming a member. Join the majority report.com. Also, just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. They're in Madison. Just coffee. Co-op, just, just outside of town. Not even outside of town. And uh, they were giving out coffee to people for free during the uh, those protests back in the day. So hopefully sitting down, drinking your just coffee, calling uh, Wisconsin voters uh, would be a big, uh, big help. Um, also, don't forget the AM Quickie. Seven minutes of your headline news in the morning. It's there when you wake up for most people. I don't know. I guess some people wake up way early. Uh, and don't forget, um, she's not on this afternoon, but she will be on uh, tomorrow afternoon and every uh, rest of the day of the week. Um, Nomi's show starts at 1 p.m. at uh, youtube.com slash the Nomi Key Show. Nomi Key Show. And uh, you can find that at patreon.com, the Nomi Key Show as well. Uh, Jamie, what's happening on the Antifada? I'm so glad you asked. Well, this week on the Antifada, you know what? I'll start with last week. Maybe you want to escape a little bit. Maybe you want to watch some scary movies to escape from scary reality. Um, we had an episode come out Wednesday where I talked with Heather Fortune and Leslie Lee about two different horror movies, uh, Host and uh, Society. And then Friday... We had a bonus ep where Andy talks about Beetlejuice with the Lit Crit guy. Very good stuff there. Um, and then this week on Wednesday, we have a very topical but also evergreen episode where we talk to the angry workers of the world. Uh, they are a collective out of London, and they really wanted to root their analysis in the working class. So they, for the past six years now, have been living in West London and doing minimum wage jobs in food manufacturing and logistics and whatnot, and just conducting a very deep workers inquiry. Um, and they have a new book out called Class Power on Zero Hours. So we talked to them uh, a little bit about their project and uh, so got down to some of the nitty gritty details of what it would take to have a uh, revolution in the UK, uh, considering bringing in all of their knowledge of supply lines and food manufacturing and all of that stuff. Um, I thought it was a really fascinating conversation that's coming out on Wednesday, post-election. Oh boy, uh, patreon.com slash the Antifada. Hopefully post-election. Yeah. Uh, Matt, 
What's happening with TMBS? Yeah, TMBS, we're going to do a live show, I think, on Wednesday night. I mean, <laughs> I think it depends what happens on Tuesday, what that is like. So, you know, stay tuned for that, folks. <laughs> you got to clean up the noise coming off that mic. Oh, no, is it bad again? Oh, you got, you got all sorts of like electrical noises. Oh. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. Probably not going to go too long today in the fun half because um, tomorrow is a 12-hour show. 12 hours from noon to midnight. You know, I suppose if, if the election's over at like 1030, maybe we'll just do it to 1130 because the drinking will be so intense that it'll uh, pass out. Um, lol, and um, if or it's possible that you know the election won't be over by 10 30, and then we'll be drinking so hard because the election's not ending. <laughs> so, I don't know, but uh, so we're gonna go a little short today, but make sure you join us tomorrow. We will be live starting at noon until midnight. Oh boy. Aim for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun. Are you ready? What, who sent us this? <laughs> Alpha males are back. 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 Boy is back. And the alpha males are back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Almost has what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back. back dj dinner song, yeah or a couple of them just put them in rotation dj dinner well the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long so i don't know if they're enough of a break that's fucking nonsense hey folks fucking reminder i do not have parkinson's and the alpha males are psych fuck them fuck, 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 fuck them Almost says what? What 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back. Doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Okay. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. And one of the things that I think has been um, fascinating it, it, to me, uh, and and the Republicans have always had this, um, had all, have always had this sort of, I guess, uh, modus operandi, right? Which is a certain amount of of projection. I don't know if this is a just in general, a um, 
a political tactic, but Republicans, they seem to really uh, operate under this fashion. I mean, I just, the the swift boating of, of John Kerry, I mean, I, I'm just, the uh, there are major examples of this. One of the things that seems to be clear in terms of what they're doing right now, I mean, we have examples uh, the other day, uh, these uh, Trump uh, guys in their pickup trucks and their uh, flags, and all the pickup trucks too are sort of like, they're not, you get the sense a lot of those pickup trucks, they're not necessarily the kind that you, you, you actually do a lot of work with. They're the sweet, like $45,000 F-150s that have got like the running boards and the sweet leather interior. And it's more like, they're not necessarily like, you know, pickup trucks that you're really worried about doing too, too much work in. Yeah. They're suspiciously clean. They're just really, you know, like, Matt, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, you know, there's, there's yeah. I mean, I like the guys who got like the vertical exhaust coming up the middle, like because they got such a big engine, they need to exhaust that thing, right? You know, like I've known guys who get that, like that, like that Ford Raptor. It's like a fifty thousand um, dollar uh, pickup truck. That's really it's just a souped up F one fifty, and they can do like they can ride through like the dunes in Portland, except for they live in upstate New York and there's no, like they're constantly looking for something to drive their truck on to sort of justify why it has this type of suspension. So yeah. My dad was a big bow hunter and we took a lot of the kids in the neighborhood up there with, and all their dads had trucks that would, you know, suffice for going into the bush or whatever to like track deer. They never actually used them for that purpose. Well, Cause they don't want to scratch them. They don't want to get them scratched. Right. Right. You know, so, but anyways, so a lot of those trucks, like they stopped in the middle of the, the old, um, uh, well, it's now the, uh, Mario Cuomo bridge, the old Tappan Zee bridge. They stopped in the middle of a major highway essentially. And, uh, to block off traffic. Uh, I mean, it's one thing I can imagine if you're doing a protest, it's another just simply as a way of trying to get people to vote for your candidate. I don't think that's going to Or to not vote. Or to not vote. But I mean, I, you know, stopping in the middle of the tap and Z, I'm sorry, in a million years, you cannot, you cannot convince me that that was a helpful thing for them. Right? Like, how do they stop in people from voting when you stop in the middle of the tap and Z bridge? You know, like there's no, it, it doesn't make any sense. Maybe the polling location was right on the other side. Yes, no, I can assure you that there is no polling location on either side. Nobody's <laughs> Palisades Mall. Exactly. Nobody's voting. They're two different states. But the, but um, so completely useless, um, uh, a completely useless gesture. But there's been reports of like of of intimidation of people going around trying to scare. Certainly the, you've seen the clips, I imagine, at this point of in Texas. One of these trucks literally sort of sideswiping um, a car that was traveling with uh, one of the, the Biden campaign buses. It's nuts. It's nuts. They're doing this stuff on the highway. Um, but I think it's pretty cool. It's it is the um, here is Kaylee McEnany saying that, in fact, it's the left that is going to do this. And. Um, Listen to this. She's on. This is there. I mean, they have to turn their actions into a mechanism for aggrievement. That is always the way. Here she is on Fox and Friends doing that. You, you're, you're, you're expecting uh, balloon drops and confetti and things like that. Instead, you know, there are businesses all across America that are boarding up because they're afraid there could be, you know, if one candidate wins uh, a certain way, suddenly people are going to be so hacked off, they're going to go and knock out the windows at the Gap or something like that. Uh, they are increasing security in Portland and Philadelphia, Lansing, Michigan, Baltimore, Charlottesville, Detroit, Janesville, Wisconsin, Chicago, New York City, and Washington, D.C. What does that say to you about the state of America in 2020 that... If a certain candidate is elected or reelected, people are going to, you know, rather than vote to impact change, they're going to try to break a window. 
Yeah, that's right, Steve. Notice what those cities have in common. They are all Democrat cities. What are they saying with these boarding up and the civil unrest that they're expecting? They're saying if you don't choose the left's chosen candidate, we will send the left out to attack you. Uh, that's as close to extortion as you can get. And Joe Biden has the power to say, stand down to the mob. Will he do it? Uh, this is all the proof you need that the left should not be given federal power. We deserve the great American tradition of democracy, uh, of peaceful elections, of accepting the vote of the American people. But the boarded up windows, the closed down stores tell you all you need to know about the modern American left. Uh, the violence is unacceptable and they are not deserving of federal power. So there you have it. Um, somehow the fact that, I mean, can you just imagine if for a moment we play this game all the time, but Barack Obama is the president or Joe Biden's the president, or I don't know, Amy Klobuchar is the president. They would be on TV going like, this is what our society has become because of this president. It's as if Donald Trump has not been president. He's not part of any of this, uh, this, this type of, uh, uh, that has brought about this type of um, concern around an election. As if, as if his refusal for saying that he would accept the, the election results um, has in no way contributed to this. It's pretty stunning, and in some way, it's also a way of deflecting from what their voters are doing now uh, and the voter intimidation that they're going to practice. And, you know, people forget this, but for almost 40 years, the Republican Party has been under a consent decree from the Justice Department to not harass people at polling places. In the, in the 80s, the early 80s, they had, uh, the Republican Party was engaging in voter harassment and intimidation in Philadelphia. I think it was Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. And uh, via a consent decree, they agreed not to deploy poll watchers. This is going to be the first year that they're going to be able to do that. Uh, that de uh, consent decree has sunsetted. Um, and so I, I think this is a way of basically setting the narrative and confusing the narrative. That's what they do on Fox. And uh, I think we're going to see to the extent that we see any type of like violence or intimidation. Um, I think we're going to see it as people are trying to vote. Who knows about what happens after as they're attempting to count the vote. But uh, to the extent that we're going to get a Brooks Brothers riot of, of 2020, I think it's going to be a lot less uh, Brooks Brothery. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, well, they have already caught a few uh, far right groups trying to intimidate people in various locations, which is, you know, yeah. not surprising. I would also say this isn't the last we're going to hear of fascist truck violence. Like, I mean, the no, no dapple uh, protests. I think the North Dakota legislature was the first to introduce a bill that limited liability for killing protesters with a vehicle. I think they've, they buy these things because they're weapons. Like these are just giant guns for the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're laying the legal framework to use these as weapons all over the place against anyone who opposes this administration. Um, I do kind of like the idea though, of turning the election into like a demolition derby. Where like whoever has the biggest Carzilla to run the other guy off the road wins. You just get these huge, huge trucks, but they're so expensive. Uh, yeah, well, uh, so money is political speech in a variety of ways. And if you want to win the election, you just got to work a little harder and buy a bigger truck. Here is uh, here are some of those trucks. That we talked about. Does this have the clip of of the truck pushing the car out of the out of the uh, from behind? I don't know if you guys have seen that that clip. Here is a, a yeah. video of those MAGA trucks, but there is one out there. You can find it, Brendan. Maybe while we're playing this, um, there there is a a video of a F one fifty. I think it is following uh, the bus. And there's another car alongside it that apparently um, was a local Democratic official with her kids. And you can see the pickup truck literally ram the car. It's, it's nuts. 
But here is uh, here is a, a clip of of um, of the video of of that happening from a different angle. Three, two, one, go. There it is. There's the uh, bus, and you can see all the Trump uh, trucks behind it. You know, with the flags, and they're really excited about this. It's it is maybe the single most ineffective uh, campaign technique I've ever heard of, frankly. Well, they're I don't think they think they're going to win that way. They're just bullying the other side. I understand. But I mean, it's going to have I mean, there's going to be backlash to this, I think. Is this well, the one people, you're talking about, Sam? Trump's people yeah. like him because he's a bully and he bullies the people they hate, which includes liberals. Watch this. Running them out of Texas. Okay, you see that white car right behind the van? And... I'm about to run out of gas, which I'm sure some of you would love. <laughs> Shit, look at that. Jeez, right there. Jeez. Yeah, isn't right that... Right there. Right there, look at that. Look at that. Like a... I mean... Shit, look at that. Yeah, that's horrible. I mean, that's... I mean, aside from the damage, like that's lucky that that's all. Yeah, that could have been like a pop tire and a spin out. Yeah, that, that's where when cop cars spin out, like people they're pursuing, that's where they hit. Yeah, I mean that's fish tail them. Yes, exactly. That's incredibly like, and then with all the all the other cars around there, I mean that's just shockingly like you, that's insane. That person there should be charged. That person should be. There's no doubt in my mind that person should be arrested. Right. I mean, that truck is specifically trying to knock that car out of there and it's nuts. And, and well, well, here's the thing is that I agree with you. The um, there is a certainly the majority of of Trump voters are going to love that. And I would say even like, I don't know. I mean, it's all speculation, but there is a portion of Trump voters who constantly need a license to be renewed, that they're not bad people and that they're not part of like, they're not like them. It's really more about policy for me. I don't like Donald Trump and I, you know, but, and I don't, you know, sometimes I think they seem a little bit racist, but not that much and misogynistic, but not that much. A clip like that, I'm sorry. It's like, it's going to impact more than zero voters. Yeah. Yeah. That's for the primary, not the general guys. Come on. Guys, no, that is we the 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 women in the suburbs who they uh you know who Donald Trump has been bleeding, they're gonna look at that. And I think my understanding is there were kids in that car. Like the idea that that is like they're redefining. Trump voters out, right? They're 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 making their coalition smaller because they're basically saying like, you know, you got to be on board with this. I mean, that's nuts. And and it's also it's like so inco- inconsequential. Like you're risking people's lives to show that we've got, you know, we're going to surround this random bus, Biden bus well, in Texas. I think in a lot of ways, too, these people feel like they, you know, the ways in which like, you know, they're shutting down these roads. If someone on the left were to shut down these roads, the cops would be there and riot gear and bussing them off and everything. They know who's on their side and they're even. Oh, you get cut off, Brendan. They're even doing this with their license plates now where they cover it with, uh, you know, painter's tape and make a thin blue line. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, you know what? It's not like Trump uh, condones this in any way. So maybe we shouldn't blame him. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Well, oh, wait, actually, he retweeted this video. Um, not only did Trump uh, OK it, but Marco Rubio in a, a rally in Florida was bragging about it. I mean, there should be here. He is. Here's Marco Rubio. Th- this guy. The next time he goes on television, whether it's, you know, meet the press or whatever it is, he should have to denounce what he said. 
I mean, this is nuts. Listen, I saw yesterday a video of these people in Texas. Did you see it? All the cars on the road with the... We love what they did, but here's the thing they don't know. We do that in Florida every day. I love seeing the boat parade. You've seen the boat parade? Look at him, right? We thank all the great it's car fascism. Boat parades up on behalf of the president. Nice little puppy. But we want them to know we've been doing that for four years. Oh, good little Marco. Oh, yes. Good little Marco with the tiny Pepe. What a nice little boy. I mean, this is mainly like, you know, those big investments you make, like boats and cars. What if you could use those to do violence against the left? Wouldn't you get excited about that? That would be great. Little Marco, little, little Marco. I think it's, I think his testicles just got a little bit bigger now because we all know what a small penis he has. Wasn't that the big, that was the big debate. God, God. Yeah. Oh, little Marco. Hey, um, part of the reason why, of course, um, you've got uh, uh, Trump supporters out there trying to commit vehicular manslaughter. Um on his behalf, it's a way of celebrating his uh, potential reelection, is because of the stakes of this election. And the stakes, uh, I think, probably are going to be a little bit higher than people think. Here's Donald Trump. He was in Montessoriville, Pennsylvania. And I don't know if people realize, uh, because not enough people read Joe Biden's platform, but I don't know if they realize some of the things that he has planned. Uh, for this country. Here is uh, Donald Trump explaining. Under Biden, there will be no school, no graduations, no weddings, no Thanksgivings, no Easter's, no Christmases, and no Fourth of July. Other than that, you're going to have a wonderful life. Now, think of this guy. Ruin American youth. There you go. No fun. Joe Biden, no fun. No fun. Well, it is true that uh, liberals hate Christmas. He I was. That's what I can tell you get on board with. What, what's the non like COVID policy Trump did this summer? Is banning TikTok. Exactly. And uh, I mean, this is the guy who said, you know, uh, this is going to be over by Easter. I'll tell you something. Thanksgiving is going to be a, um, a, a a disastrous time. Or actually, I should say, four weeks after Thanksgiving is going to be a disastrous time in this country. I think. I, I mean, I think the the um, the spread. We're like we're we are perfectly positioned for Thanksgiving to be a national disaster. Uh, it you know, fortunately, it will happen four weeks later, so people won't be able to make the direct correlation. But um, I think it's going to be. A mess. Between- yeah, I'm s- Go ahead. I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to be able to quarantine myself for two weeks so I could see my grandma. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, people have got to make that decision. And then and then also, I think, a quarantine on the other end. And um, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be super, super difficult. And but the problem is, is that like. The vast majority of Americans have been told that what you just suggested is completely, it's crazy. I mean, honestly, like the, the, there's a, I think, I don't know if the, the majority of Americans believe that, but, but certainly they've been told it, that the idea that you would be that concerned is crazy. Like you're crazy for thinking that you need to, uh, quarantine yourself for a couple of weeks before you go see your grandmother. That's crazy. And, uh, and of course, you know, Friday, a hundred thousand new infections. It was just like two weeks ago, we were saying like 75,000 broke a record and, uh, the hospitalizations and the deaths are going to follow. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it is, it is a nightmare. You'd think Trump would at least be anti-school, right? Well, a public school, public schools. It's okay to shut the public schools. School sucks. No homework. Have fun. 
He seems nah, like the no he's got, homework kind of guy. He's got a degree, he, and he likes to bash Joe about finishing uh, last in his class. Like, it's, it's yeah, to his prestige, it unfortunately. It's true. Like, we think of uh, liberals as being the grade-grubbing nerds, but Trump is also obsessed with grades and test scores. Yeah. I mean, his is based on, like, genes and <laughs> sort of his genetic eugenics interests, I think, but his ability to pay people to take tests for him um let's uh (laughs) i just i feel like i've played this clip of like you know 10 year anniversary for this show uh i've been doing this now for 16 years i feel like i've played this clip i don't know a dozen times over those years it's just different people saying the exact same thing and it's so nice to be able to play a clip with the newest member of the right predicted this some time ago when we knew that Dave Rubin was uh, was deciding he, he was looking uh, more carefully at where his bread was being buttered. Here he is with, um, with Glenn Beck uh, Friday, visiting the boss, going in, talking to the boss, as it were, for, um, for Dave Rubin. And um, this is uh, this is pretty good. This is a pretty good one. Dave, you're Jewish. Um, yeah. the, I feel as I was listening to you for the first time, <laughs> I feel. I just want to say, like, look, a lot of people are going to mock uh, Dave Rubin and this and that. But I think it takes a lot of guts for him to admit uh, to his audience that he's Jewish. So good for Dave Rubin for doing that. That's really good. Dave, you're Jewish. Um, yeah. the, I feel, as I was listening to you for the first time, I feel kind of like I bet a lot of Jews felt in Germany where you're like, but that's so crazy. They'd never yeah. do that. Uh, and you look back now and go, all of the signs were there. They were telling you what they were going to do. How did you miss it? I Am I crazy for thinking that? Yes. You know, it's one of those things where you start thinking it and you go, oh, could we really be there? And that's part of why it's so hard to think about it in a clear way. Could we really be there? And I actually think the answer is yes. If these people were to get the institutional power, they will do all of the things that they purport Trump to believe in and to do that he never does. <laughs> they're, they're Incidentally, they're talking about uh, Antifa people who are going to get institutional power and um, then, I guess, treat conservatives like Jews during the Holocaust. Um, he means Joe Biden as Antifa people, by the way. That's why he's voting for Trump this time. Yeah, there's no difference between leftists and liberals in their mind. Well, I mean, that's, uh, I, yeah, I don't think that's quite the point. I mean, that's true. There, You're right. Different. But I'd also don't know that like I, I mean I I I think it's even sort of I don't think leftists were are going to take the power and then end up, you know, hurting people into <laughs> trains and to concentration camps, right? Well like, Dave, Dave changes the question he's asked because Glenn asks him, Do you think they might be Hitlerian? And then Dave says, Yeah, I think they might just be exactly what they say Trump is doesn't really answer the question no i mean the the amazing thing is is like you know um the i guess the idea is that glenn's trying to say like you know are we missing all the signs that now people forget how what kind of a lunatic glenn beck was when he was on fox and and frankly on cnn for that matter um he would he was Developing all of these conspiracies that many of which at its core were uh, developed by anti-Semites, where he would have all these these sort of conspiracies. And, you know, uh, somebody had embedded socialist messages into the building of uh, of of 30 Rockefeller Center. And I mean, I'm not kidding. Like literally uh, he was saying these things now. They they may have had iconography of of the era or something, but you know, the Rockefellers weren't necessarily looking to overthrow the status quo that much. Uh, but, 
Uh, and he's he's circling back around and he's using Dave Rubin as cover. I mean, first of all, the fact that Dave Rubin's Jewish does not give him any insight to what Jews were ne or necessarily what Jews were feeling in uh, in the the 1930s in Germany. That would require Dave Rubin to have read and that would have required Dave Rubin for the capacity to read and also assess things from what he's read. And he hasn't established that that's a fact yet, right? I mean, is there any evidence that Dave Rubin actually can read things and uh, and sort of, I don't know, uh, understand them? Uh, I mean, I, the, come on, <laughs> no, I don't think there is, but it's just shocking. And you know what else? I mean, he could have said like, you know, uh, the, I, I love how they, you know, we're, we'll tell people that you're Jewish, but we're going to keep the other thing on the DL because uh, we don't want to get, uh, you know, it's going to be too much of a problem. I mean, oh, <laughs> yeah. Glenn, why did you have to tell them that, you know, I hate standpoint epistemology. <laughs> Did uh, Jews excommunicate I, people? Just wondering. I would like to share a Three Arrows video that, like, this is sort of them doing this argument. This is how societies turn cruel, featuring Sargon of Akkad. But basically, it, like, they're aping what leftists were saying about the concentration camps. I would say the freak out about the concentration camps and that terminology was pretty revealing and how sensitive they are about the accurate use of that term. And I think Three Arrows does a good job in this video. Uh, demonstrating how actually societies do get like that. So if Glenn and Dave were curious about something like that, I would point them to that Three Arrows video. Yeah, I'm sure they're really going to watch it. And it's, yeah, it's, I mean, or, you know, the people that are on YouTube looking for a response to that. No, all those people who freaked out at AOC for calling the concentration camps, concentration camps, uh, I find it really galling uh, as a Jew myself and someone who just, cares about the world like never again doesn't just mean never again for jews right i mean that's not how i think about it no. i think it means never again for anyone but you know some people disagree yeah that was uh, uh undoubtedly not the point <laughs> We just narrowly tail. We've built all of these remembrance um memorials just to narrowly tailor our message can happen to others, but not to us. Um, all right, let's just do this one more clip and then we'll get to some phones and some IMs. This, uh, I, this is pretty stunning. Now we got an IM about it when we brought it up last time. Like, you know, Donald Trump is out there. He's claiming that doctors are juicing the numbers uh, for who has COVID-19 because apparently Medicare... Medicaid payments uh, will go up if you get that, and this is this is something they're running on. This they are they are still sort of convinced that the way to win an election, or maybe just to uh, organize a country, is to be in total denial about a pandemic, and that's what's made their whole. Me well, here, play this from Jason Miller uh, on. Uh, on George Stephanopoulos' show this weekend. President on the campaign trail on Friday. Let's talk about that with Trump campaign senior advisor Jason Miller. Jason, thank you for joining us this morning. The AMA responded to that immediately. Oh, then the AMA I'm saying I'm it was a malicious. Trump had said on the, on the campaign trail that they're juicing the numbers. Doctors are saying that they have COVID when they do, uh, that their patients had COVID when they don't because they want more money to that immediately the head of the ama saying it was a malicious outrageous and completely misguided for the president suggests that doctors are inflating covid deaths why does the president repeatedly uh, attack doctors saying they're working on the front line saying they're inflating covid numbers well george good morning sunday morning where i would tell you that tens of thousands of people are waking up in pittsburgh this morning and reading the post gazette and seeing that they've endorsed a republican for the first time since 1972 that's president trump for his re-elections we're excited about that uh, to your comment about the president yesterday on the campaign trail i don't think he was attacking anybody at all i think he was talking about how most americans want to safely and securely reopen the country get back to work get back to life as normal jason we all just virus. saw it he was and talking is, about it doctors inflating COVID. COVID deaths for money. 
George, I'm not going to get into the, the billing aspects of which there have been many uh, reports on. There have been all sorts of independent things of pointing to that. But the fact of the matter is people want to get their life back to normal. They're tired of the lockdowns. You look at these Democrat-run states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. We're seeing this on the campaign trail with the rallies. People are tired of these lockdowns. They want to safely reopen. So you're repeating that you believe that doctors are inflating COVID deaths for money. I think there have been a number of reports that have raised issues out there regarding billing and things like that. But again, the choice on the ballot on Tuesday is President Trump and people who want tax cuts or Joe Biden and people who want tax hikes. That's what's on the ballot on Tuesday. Well, but the president's talking about doctors on the front lines inflating uh, COVID deaths, which, as the head of the MA said, is malicious and completely misguided. Well, there's also another thing. Um, and and. I think somebody I am me the other day that, uh, no, it's true. My mom worked at a, blah, blah. Uh, I don't know who that was, but here's what I would suggest to you. If it is the case that you know somebody who is aware of a doctor or an institution that is um, faking that people have COVID in their hospital and are billing Medicare or Medicaid for this, I would encourage you to email me, tell me the information. And uh, I'll get, I'll find a lawyer. Maybe, maybe we'll get, um, maybe we'll get uh, Ronald Reagan, and we will bring what is known as the Keytam case. Uh, and that case will net us a bunch of cash because there is a huge bounty available to people. You can, you can Google it. Keytam, Q U I T A M, I think it is, and you will get a bounty for helping uh, the U.S. government find fraud. So uh, um, maybe nobody's inspired to do that, despite the fact there's all these cases of fraud going around. It's really, I mean, just amazing to me. Um, How much public money are we even talking here that they could possibly be defrauding? I mean, I don't know, but uh, key TAM cases, you you can make some cash. Go back to law school for that stuff. <laughs> um, I don't know why they invite that guy on. I mean, to allow to say that stuff. Call him from a 931 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Oh, my God. Who is this frog that keeps calling? Pepe, is that you? Wait a second. I wonder if that's what it is. Are you, are you in some type of distress? Is there, are you, are you okay? Is there a fire? There's a fire down the road. <laughs> I like the way, did anybody ever see that Lassie? Lassie? Yeah. That's, or the one with No, the, you're the only one because you're so old. Well, I mean, I, you'd be surprised how often I say like, oh, it's just like, uh, I went to, um, so um, we have like a little pod for Saul, right? Like two or three of his buddies. So like the, you know, families all sort of agree, like, you know, these guys can play with each other. So we went to um, over one of their house for Halloween. Masks, everybody's wearing masks. We're outside. It's cold. And um, I I said to the the host of the party, I said, oh, she was wearing like a black dress and black wig. And I'm like, oh, are you Anne Frank? <laughs> she was from the Adams family. I just, I, my whole like repertoire of references are just not like, just from a different the diary of Wednesday Adams. It was, yeah, it was. That is a bold choice for Halloween costumes. I mean, and- I, I've seen Stranger, but I was like, uh, that was uh, sexy Anne Frank. I mean, I, I, I felt bad. I felt bad. I was like, I, I, I don't know. I just, uh, that's, <laughs> that's going to be my costume next year. Call from the 816 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? It's Kowalski. I live out in Nevada. Kowalski in Nevada? Another Kowalski? Are you, yeah. re- are you related to the Kowalski from, uh, from Nebraska? Our last name means Smith, so no. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm a Green Party. Uh, voters have been since native. Okay. 
And I think that uh, whenever he was, uh, whenever the president was hey, walking do down. Do you the- have, uh, can you like just j- jiggle around your microphone or something? What are you, what are you speaking into? I'm wearing some headphones that have a, a, a mic on them. Yeah. Can you just use the phone? Oh, uh, it's, it's my computer. Oh, okay. The, All right. Just pull the, pull the mic just a little bit away from your face, maybe. Okay. Yeah, that's a little bit better. All right. Well, as I was saying, I'm a Green Party voter and have been since New Year. And I think when the president was, did that photo op was when I was starting to go, uh, I'm going to vote Democrat. But like when he, when he was at the debate, I think me and a lot of other hard party Green, green Party voters were just like, I, I, don't, I think we need to vote Democrat this time. Because before then, we had a good shot at getting that, uh, what we think, uh, 3%. But you need to get the third party going. Don't you need 5%? Oh, that's what I meant. Sorry. I'm a little high from uh, smoking weed out here. I, I grow it. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, that's good. Um, Typical. Well, I mean, I I think you should vote uh, for the Democrat. I don't think that there's going to be a big opportunity, frankly, for the Greens to get 5% this time. Uh, right. And, and I got to be honest with you. Like, uh, I also uh, voted for Nader. I did a vote swap, but I was definitely more sympathetic to – uh, the the chances of the Green Party. Uh, I I I think if the Green Party was actually serious about building something for, you know, politically, um, then they would be far more focused on local races than they have been. Which is not to say that they don't have any focus on it. But I mean, you can go and look at how the Green Party has done. Uh, Twenty years ago, they were a lot stronger in local races than they have become, and all the energy just ends up being, um, I think. Frankly, they've been incredibly counterproductive. Um, but uh, in Nevada, it would make a big difference. You know, your vote can actually um, have some type of impact. You still there? Oh, I was going to talk uh, to him a little bit about the dirty break strategy. Are you familiar with this? The dirty break strategy? Yeah, it's something that's been bandied about in DSA. Uh, basically, uh, we don't really have the social base yet to have a workers' party that can succeed on its own ballot line. Therefore, until we have that, we're going to run our candidates uh, sort of parasitically on the Democratic ballot line because maintaining a ballot line takes a lot of resources that we don't have. And maybe someday... The idea is we have enough power, we have enough, uh, we're doing organizing simultaneously in in the trade unions, in the housing movement, in the streets, in all sorts of places. Um, And maybe eventually we have a strong enough workers movement that we can actually break with the Democratic Party and have our own uh, ballot line. But that's like down the road from now. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it's win win because one of two things could happen. One is you could build enough. I mean, you got like Lee Davis, right? Uh, uh, is it Lee Davis in Pennsylvania who uh, won that uh, state senate? You know, sort of famously won uh, Lee Carter in Virginia. Carter, sorry. Um, and uh, I mean, there are others. I mean, I, I, I mean, frankly, I, I mean, I think that's what what should happen. And, and one of two things happen. One, either you build enough of a um, of a uh, brand, as it were, that you can uh, peel off and create your own party, or or you've taken over the entire apparatus. And who cares what the name of it is, right? I mean, I, I that's the thing. I I mean, um, who cares? Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree with you again from from the left because uh, no matter. I mean, I do think there are differences between the Democratic Party structurally and a hypothetical workers party. Um, But I think once you get into power, no matter what, um, your workers party is still subject to the same pressures of managing a capitalist economy in a globalized market. Um, So really the key ingredient, whether you're talking Democratic Party realignment or breaking with the Dems and starting workers party is having an outside independent base of power that is able to, you know, help the people in charge stand up to these larger uh, economic forces. With that said, 
Bernie Sanders and the squad did a, um, a Zoom call the other day. Um, and in many respects, I mean, they're, you know, it's not, uh, I don't know the politics necessarily are perfectly aligned, but certainly the idea behind um, the squad is to create a small caucus within, maybe even within the progressive caucus, um, to create, you know, some base of power that can be built upon. And they're leveraging uh, the Democratic Party apparatus, um, but also, in some respects, uh, there's obviously some tension there. Um here is uh, Bernie explaining why he and the squad align politically and are supportive of one another on that very Zoom call. Somebody looking and say, hey, it's that old Jewish white guy. What does he have in common with these young people, women of color? What, what? And the answer is, I have more in common with you than the overwhelming majority of my colleagues. Why is that? Because we come from the same place. We talk, we understand each other. We all come from similar, indifferent but we all come from working class backgrounds. We know what it's like to struggle out there. So you're right. You make me feel less alone. It's true. And I love each of you. I really do. You guys are extraordinary in each in your own way. And uh, just thank you so much for what you're doing. And we're going to we go forward you, together. Yes. Yeah. You. After the election, we're going to squat up and fight the, every injustice out there. Thank you so much for being with us. And, okay, and I love you, the fact that Rashida let you get a word or two in tonight. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't even start. Don't even start. Are you trying to hurt us with this? Well, I know it. Uh, man, it's not too late, guys. We can still swap out Biden for Bernie. That's what they've been saying on Fox News. <laughs> it's the Bernie Sanders agenda. Running everything anyways. So, yeah, that's true. You know, I just went through this detailed critique of democratic socialism on the Antifada, and I was really super done with it. And that video just brought me right back. There you go. It's too bad. But, uh, yeah. but it is, you know, I mean, the of the six people in that uh, like little or grid. Um, five, six of that is very much the future. I mean, with all due respect to Bernie, I mean, I think, you know, I don't know how long. What do you mean? Well, I just mean like the future. When I think about like the future, I'm thinking like, you know, when my daughter is voting and when, like, I don't think my daughter's ever going to have an opportunity to vote for Bernie, but I think she's going to have an opportunity to vote for, uh, you know, all those other folks there. Some Bernie's going to live forever. Okay. Well, the millennials will give him their blood and their organs. He's immortal. But maybe he maybe he becomes uh, Secretary of Labor. He is going to be a floating head in a jar a hundred years from now when we finally have uh, the social movements necessary to make him president if we still have, you know, presidents. Orb at that point. Yeah. Calling from a 707 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Say what? Good afternoon, Sam. Yes. Good afternoon, Sam. This is Jack from the Alamo. I'm sorry, from who? From where? Jack from the Alamo. Jack from the Alamo? The actual Alamo? Yes, yes, yes. Jack from the Alamo. I wanted to talk about some numbers. Remember it? Calls with you. Yes, I'm John's big brother, the taller, more handsome one. Oh, I see. Yeah. Do you see? Yeah. <laughs> Are we, are we going to agree not to agree today and talk about some polling? Okay. No, not Sam. I just wanted to call. Always want to call big fan, but I love John. <laughs> I had to imitate his little peckerwood voice. All right. That was pretty but good. But I love the show. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. I love the show. I what? just wanted to say this for a long time. I used to be, I'm actually Jason from the 707. Uh, Jason, Sonoma from County. Sa uh, Jason from Sonoma County. Yeah, there you go. The best county, by the way. I know. Anyways, I just want to say you were instrumental me, instrumentally uh, significant in getting me off the right wing hate train, basically. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, you're pretty smart, Sam. And you're personable. But I never understood this. And I, I got to ask all of you guys this. 
why can't Sam get the, uh, what is it, the, the subscribers on YouTube that Pac-Man pulls? And Pac-Man started after Sam. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's not true. Pac-Man had been on YouTube far, far, far longer than we He he was? As far as I thought, he came on a little bit after you. How much longer was he on? Oh, many years. I mean, we didn't even, we, uh, we'll go over this with Dorsey tomorrow, but we were actually, when we first started to stream, we streamed on Justin TV, which turned into Twitch. Um, okay. Yeah. No, Pacman's been at this for a long time, and he's frankly he's 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 a little sharper with the business acumen than I am. But yeah, I forgot. Subscribe to our YouTube right down there. Yeah, we need to scrub. Hey, put it this way: I always listen to you on YouTube, and I got a membership anyways because you guys are big hearted and you give out free memberships to people in need. Well, thanks, I love man. That. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for calling. I love that. What what, what was the big thing that turned you uh, from uh, from the right? You, you really want to know it was a documentary on uh, Muammar Gaddafi and uh, had Cenk on there, a little clip it. So I went down. The, I used to listen to Rush, Michael Savage, all of them. You name wow. them, I listen to them. And so uh, the reason why was actually from the 2000 election. When Gore lost, I voted for Gore. That was my first presidential election. And I didn't trust the government after that. So I went small government and very hateful and listened to Rush and all that went down a rabbit hole. But I was always big into documentaries, always big into history and wars. And I saw that documentary, saw Jank on there, and then got you with at the same time and started listening around, what, 2000, maybe 13 or 12 or 11? I can't wow. remember. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I appreciate yeah. the call, man. Thank you. Thank you for well, the Well, I wish you luck. You need, you need more followers, but you also need to do one thing for me. Get some tank tops in your swag shop. Some of us like to go to the gym and, and show who we support. Yeah, I know. I, I should do that. It. I should do that. Maybe, uh, yeah, we, we'll get some we get some tank tops. Because you actually do have alpha males that support you, and I'm one of them. I'm not surprised by that. You know, that, yeah. That we travel in packs, and, us alpha males. Yeah, we so, do. I mean, someone's got to protect you guys, you know? Right. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the call, man. All right. Love you, Sean. Right, right. Look at that. Getting to love you from the alpha male. Uh, Slappy Tubbs, my dad just died. Long time lefty that voted for Reagan once. Ooh, just once. Have to quarantine for two weeks before I helped my mom back in New Jersey. Couldn't go to my father's funeral. I'm sorry about that. That's horrible. Can I get a shofar for my dad, Jack? Yeah, Jack, this is for you. Uh, my heart really goes out to folks who can't, who, who, I mean, that's very difficult. All right, let's go for some IMs now. Uh, let's see. P word. Not sure how we will manage, all manage simping for both Jamie and Emma, but we'll just have to try. Folks, you, you got to work. Got to work at this stuff. Caboose is loose. 538 had the odds of Trump winning in 2016 around 30%, which feels about right, considering that he won Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania by the skin of his teeth. 538 now has Trump's chances at 10%. It would take more than just a traditional polling error to get Trump over the finish line. He needs a lot of voter suppression mixed in with large polling error in his favor. Both of those are possible. Indeed. Indeed. It's it's so frustrating. Um Sam, I may have missed it, but did you ask Ben Wickler if he heard about how Ron Johnson strangled his neighbor's dog? No, I didn't. I didn't hear that either. Um, oh yeah, Bez, Bez Guapo is Reagan going to be? Sh- we, sorry, we should say with regards to Ron Johnson that that was a hypothetical tweet that he read out um, at the tech, you know, um, hearings where he's like, this person said I strangled my dog. And then the person also said it was a a joke. And then he's like, how can we trust you? If yeah, it was clearly a joke that he still got really upset about. I see. Uh, Because he's hiding something maybe. Yeah. Maybe it was a cat. Uh, is Reagan going to be shadow banned tomorrow? Reagan's constantly shadow banned, but he has like technology that gets through somehow. Uh, crass rebuttal. Everyone was always referencing 2016, but there was an election in 2018. How do the trends from 2016 and 2018 tell us about 2020? Because if 2018 was a blue wave, does that mean 2020 is a blue tsunami? Seems like it could be. Well, it, it, I mean, it could be is the answer that we could give on all of this stuff. 
it's tough to measure to it's tough to divine anything from 2018 to 2020 because one's an off-year election one's a general election i mean a, a you know a presidential election so it's sort of difficult it's not apples to apples that's why people do 2016 to 2018 um let's see disco stew i hear solidarity mentioned a lot by leftists on this show and i think not voting for biden here shows a complete lack of solidarity with the working class and minorities who overwhelmingly support biden both now and in the primary i, I tend to agree with that snack the court what proportion sorry what proportion of the poor vote in this country just saying I think uh, there, there, are, there are two sides. There are two sides to this. I'm not going to argue for one or the other right now, though. Well, I don't think that do, do, you would have to assume that the percentage of poor who do not vote, which I know is high, um, specifically don't want a candidate to win as opposed to, or, or just, they're just not interested in engaging just the, the, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's tough to predicate this on based on an assumption about what people want when you don't know. Right. But okay. So, uh, uh, 46% of potential voters with family incomes less than twice the federal poverty line voted in the 2016, uh, presidential election compared to, so by half, um, compared with 68% of those with family incomes above twice the poverty line. So 40 like, I agree that it's probably slightly more in their best interest for Biden to win than for Trump to win. But it is hard to say what, uh, what people want when okay. we don't have like solid well, you, data on that. Well, you do know what the, the other 50% of people who vote. So 50% of people living in poverty don't vote. We do know that the other 50% do vote. And so it would be in solidarity with those, with, with the, with those people who are, who are engaging. Sure. Like that Mulaney thing, I thought, I mean, I only saw the clip, but I thought the thing was funny where we picked two old guys and then we've one of the old guys, but then to say like, nothing's going to change at all. For him. <laughs> for him, that is yeah. definitely true. I mean, that would have been a funny joke because um, that's what specifically Biden says, had said to donors earlier, right? Like he was telling people nothing's going to fundamentally change as in like, we're going to return to the status that. quo, but right. Like, so, I mean, I understand why Mulaney wrote that joke, but it would have been a better joke. And, uh, <laughs> From both funnier and from a political standpoint, better if he had said for people like me. Yeah, exactly. That, I mean, that is exa that's actually the joke. But if he doesn't say for people like me, like if he was to say like, nothing's going to change. Like if you're a DACA person. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, I understand that's a narrow like set of people, right? You're only talking hundreds of thousands of people and maybe millions when, when you talk about their families. But it's just so it's just like it's it's such a big it's such a big difference in those people's lives like i don't know if you could if you know to be that flip about the implications for hundreds of thousands of people never mind like you know the hypothetical that what's stephen miller planning uh you know in the event yeah. Look, and, nothing will fundamentally change doesn't mean nothing will change at all like and it might be fundamental for the people that those changes impact for sure uh again i can see this from both sides i can I see, see sides there too. are some differences that will definitely be real to a lot of people and that's why gun to my head i have always said i would vote for biden in a freaking swing state um on the other hand no it's not going to change anything structurally uh it, it, it's it's the difference between like the left will change things structurally and the, and though. the liberal approach <laughs> to like oh how can we help the poor 
oh, uh, versus what are the root causes of poverty? So they're like dismantling the right. administrative state is going to fundamentally change the structures of the country. They're going to continue well, that's to the, dismantle that's the key every. Point. Yeah, like that is fundamental and that is structural. That like, fundamental changes are happening, and Biden's going to stop them. Yes, I mean, I think I think it's more accurate to say. Uh, in terms of the race between Biden and Trump, we are not going to get a, um, a, a, a socialist restructuring of our, of our, of our form of government. I, I don't think we would have gotten that with Bernie Sanders either, frankly. Right. I mean, we no. just like the, the, you know, so if John Mulaney got up there and said like, incidentally, I know we have an election come up, but I hope you know that elections are wholly irrelevant until we have a, um, you know, a, a revolution where our entire system radically changes. In some ways, that have been like, okay, well, thank you, uh, you know, for that. But he wasn't saying that. I mean, that's the thing is that, that like, he, he was not making that point. And, and, you know, Bernie Sanders wouldn't, change anything according to that for fundamental formula. But there is an argument that stopping the, you know, I think the addition of like having the government provide these, like the administrative uh, aspects they're talking about is, is a pretty fundamental change from where it was like, you know, in the, uh, in the 1900s, let's say, or excuse me, the 1800s and uh, 19th century. And um, I, I guess it's just to say that nothing fundamental is going to change is not even that accurate. Like, you, you, I think it's pretty clear what, you know, the Trump administration's plan is for, for these type of agencies. You're getting back to sort of like a, um, uh, a, you know, a Lochner era. And that's a pretty fundamental change. It's not a, it's not like a revolutionary change necessarily, uh, but, and Biden's not going to usher in a revolutionary change. That's true. But you have to define change pretty narrowly to say that there's not going to be a change. Right. I mean, you, you have to have a very specific set of things, which I, uh, you know, I, I think do need to change, but um, I don't know. I think that if you said the fundamental problems won't be addressed, then I think nobody would have any disagreements. I mean, maybe you could say that, you know, Biden will stave off uh, the wrong kind of structural change, even if he's not going to make any structural changes himself. Yeah, that's what I'm I think saying. 100%. That's that's pretty big. Uh, I mean, you know, to have. <clears throat> You know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's pretty. A lot of it, we just got to wait and see. Yeah, I know. But some, I think we can know, right? Like, like DACA, voting rights. Like, I mean, there's a whole host of things that I think it's just like to just sort of brush them aside. You know, I don't Look know. Look at what happens on the state level as over? well. <laughs> you want to know what won me over to thinking that, I want Biden to win. Uh, foreign policy, specifically towards Cuba, but towards a lot of countries. Uh, people who like really work on this stuff, people who live in Cuba, are very convinced that uh, Biden would continue Obama's policies and lift the embargoes and whatnot, and he would probably lift the sanctions on Iran as well. That's so Iran is horrific. As someone who's like tries to be an internationalist, that that argument persuaded me. Yeah, and and look, um, um, Clinton had uh, horrible sanctions on Iraq that were devastating, and the ones I think they're going on Iran are probably on some level even worse because they're more isolated, and and it's COVID. <laughs> um, I mean, just sheer numbers of immiserated people are going to be less. Is it going to be a fundamental change? No way. But um, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it seems slam dunky to me. Uh, Disco stew. I, um, oh yeah, we just did that. 
Snack the courts. So is Trump going to change his tune on stopping the vote counting tomorrow? Too close to call, hoping early turnout is leaning towards Biden. You know, I wanted to get into this with Aaron. I didn't have a chance, but it, it appears that like it's not as polarized as as people anticipated, that the the early vote leans Democratic, but it's not like 80-10. Do you know what I mean? Now, we also don't know how many Republicans are voting for Biden. So the, the disparity could be even more in terms of actual Biden voters. But in terms of registrations, it's not doesn't seem to be so dramatic. Um, babe alert. Hello, MR crew. Can we please get pride shirts in the store? I want to wear a gay flag left his best shirt. Oh, that's a pretty good idea. Can't wait for uh, the stream tomorrow. GD democracy. Um, that's a good idea. We got to get, maybe somebody's got to do a design. Frankie Ka, can you think of any reason why Bernie and the squad are not endorsing Shahid Buttar? Would it be a, a big win for progressives to retire Nancy? All from uh, Munich, Germany. Um, my guess would just be that um, it comes with a huge political risk, downside. Um there may be other issues. I'm not sure, but um, I think that's probably it. Uh, that they part of why you endorse is not necessarily just as a way of saying like I want. I mean, from a politics a polit politician standpoint, is I want this person to win. It's also you make a calculation of how how likely are they going to win and what at what cost does this come. That's the only thing I can tell you. I mean, if you're looking for any politician, I don't care who it is to be um to be you know 100% principled and full of integrity you're i mean i don't even know what human beings you're going to find that way either frankly but politicians no that's not what the job requires L literally requires sort of like assessing now you can find ones that are that are more have more integrity than others and, and one that are more principled and ones that are bolder, like they're braver, but than others. And I think those people are, but you're not never going to get to 100%. It just doesn't. Um, Ryan in Wyoming, Sam, I literally work in Wyoming on these type of trucks. I work on a hundred thousand dollar Ford trucks that haven't been off the asphalt. The, that's the thing that is like, so disingenuous about that whole sort of like construct of like, you know, pickup guys, because they're basically just um, minivans for, for guys who just are, don't are too embarrassed to drive a minivan. That's basically what they are. The union uh, monk fruit. Those trucks are called FU trucks, Texas commie. You got to stop typing. I can hear you. Texas, right. Tommy, the trucks uh, surrounding that bus run I-35 between San Antonio and Austin, which is a super dangerous corridor. Shadow band. Let's try this again. Trump will lose like the Patriots, taking loss after loss in each and every state. Although if the Republicans execute cheating like Bill Belichick, we're in trouble. You're not one of my books, Sammy. I, I'm never going to read that, that person again. Oh, I understand the election better than ever now. Silver ball stud. What's it say to Ducey that if certain sports teams wins, cars get turned over? Melancholy. I know this is an indication of anything, but I live in relatively blue Silicon Valley. But while driving, I saw a huge pickup truck with three huge flags and thought, uh oh. And I turned and saw the third flag was actually a huge Biden Harris banner. That was fun. <laughs> uh, riding from uh, Wisconsin, Ryan, my mother in law is making the two hour drive down to Kenosha to see Trump. That's a two week ban. Hey. Josh from Tucson. While riding out my bicycle yesterday, we saw several Trump trucks driving through the streets of Tucson. Sam's butt. Tried shooting up liquid IV, but it's actually a lot more effective if it's taken by mouth. Yeah, it's true. Gons, Kaylee M. used to support Biden. These careers are awful. Bug a wolf. Trump's early victory claim is the same strategy Buttigieg used in Iowa. Yeah. Here for Hugo. Less Brooks Brothers. More tactical. Uh, Mercedes. That black truck almost hit protesters in San Antonio back in September. Wow. Resist program is a great thread about this. and shows the man who was in the black truck. If... Uh, SAPD did anything about this in September, he wouldn't have endangered folks. Wow. That's nuts. I don't know if that's true, but that sounds, if it is, it's nuts. 
Call from a 516 area code. Folks, we're not going to get to many more calls today. Oh, my God. That takes a lot of... 614 area code. Who's this? Oh, dear. Hey, what's going on, Sam? My name's Liam. Liam, what's on your mind? Well, I just had a question about what do you think is going to happen if Trump decides to challenge votes? I know you did a podcast last week about you know, what's going to happen when it comes to workers and protesting with around the country. But I don't know the reality of the situation. I mean, what do you mean what's going to happen? What's going to happen in terms of the challenge or what's going to happen with people? So Trump challenged the votes. What's going to happen with people? Um, I think it depends on where and what under what auspices, but I would imagine you're going to, it's going to start with protests like in front of the Supreme court. And, um, I think, I think what, what Joshua had basically outlined for us, I think it's a question as to, they, they probably have a, um, they probably have thresholds of things that are happening as to what they will start to call for. Uh, through their various networks. I mean, I, I, I really don't know. It, it's too much. There's too many hypotheticals. I think, you know, look, it's, it's a situation that's sort of like a, like a basketball game, I think on some level, right? There's a whole set of plays and uh, that you, you know, uh, you, the coach calls as, you know, depending on like where it is in the game and who's tired and uh, what is working for the other team and, you know, what kind of tempo you want to uh, set. And so, uh, you can't really know. It's just really you can only prepare. Mm-hmm. Just after listening to that podcast Thursday, and I heard that there were around thirty-five thousand pledges to uh, American workers to stop, you know, the country from continuing on. And I just didn't know. I don't know. I was just curious on what you thought about the reality of that situation. I I, I think. Look, I, I I think if there's a scenario where, you know. If the same thing that happened in Florida in twenty in, in the year two thousand happened today, I think you would see those thirty five thousand people mobilize, and I think you would see unions, and I think you'd see a lot more. I, I mean, I think that it would be the the way that the country would react would be radically different. I think. I hope you're right. I just don't know if we have the kind of social forces that would be necessary to go up against I, something I, like I, that. I don't know that they'll be successful. I'm just saying that the reaction is going to be different. I mean, the reaction at that time was completely, everybody was just like, you know, not, there was no reaction. <laughs> there was none. There was no, but no, no protest. No, but nobody even talked about it. Yeah. it. It's not going to happen that way this time. Yeah. I mean, I think we can learn something from the workers movement in Bolivia that was able to keep an election from being stolen basically uh i don't think we're there yet but i do hope even if this fails this time around that it will get people exercising those muscles again because the truth is uh this is not a unique emergency we've had an emergency situation for a really 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 long time for a whole lot of people for whom fascism is already here for the people in ice prisons for the people in rotting away in regular prisons uh that it's been an emergency so hope my hope is my positive take on this is maybe uh, a whole bunch of new people will get involved around this issue and then stay involved around all of the other issues that are very important Evan from New Jersey. Here's a tidbit. Calculation of expected deaths is about rate of change. Since as cases go up, so will expected deaths. From October 9th, 26, 15,000 more expected deaths. From October 26th to 30th, slightly more 15,000. Wow. I'm not 100% sure I understand that dynamic, but it does suggest that the rate of expected deaths doubled over the last week in October relative to the first in October. That'd be a bad sign, right? Because wasn't one of the positive things is not even a doubling, right? If, if over a four day period, you've got 15,000 versus 
a 15 day period, that's a tripling of the rate. Wow. That's nuts. It, it, and then, and then this is all going to be leading into Thanksgiving, which, all right, final call of the day. Shoot, I was supposed to go early, stop early today. See, this is what I'm getting. I'm, this is like, it's like I'm exercising for like the marathon tomorrow. Yeah, you went too long in your uh, warm up run. I did. All right, calling from a 216 area code. You're the final call of the day. Hey, uh, this is Stephen from Pittsburgh. Stephen from Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you kind of a little report on the ground from here in uh, Allegheny County, because obviously Pennsylvania is pretty important. Um, first, shout out to my state rep, Sarah Inamorado. She's a DSA member that we elected back in 2018. Awesome. Uh, she for my district, which is amazing, super proud. Um, but this was so. This was year I registered uh, to vote. I registered months ago, uh, and then requested my mail-in ballot. Um, and I got my voter ID card about a month ago. But the Pennsylvania voter registration site is pretty much continuously just said, you know, unable to find your information, and they. I got a text this past week from the Election Protection Coalition, which doesn't sound like an official government entity. I'm pretty sure it's privately run, but yeah. the, the text is something along the lines of, you know, 12,000 voters in your county uh, have had clerical issues with their uh, ballots, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, by the time I got the text, which was just like three days ago, uh, all the temporary offices have closed. And so the only election office is the main one in Pittsburgh. Uh, so I went down there today and they don't have a record of ever having received a mail-in ballot registration. Uh, so I'm now directed to go vote in person tomorrow, which is fine, but it's what is making me nervous is that, you know, we, we've been led to believe that if you have requested a mail-in ballot, then if you go vote tomorrow, it's gonna be a provisional ballot. Um, so I, I don't know. And, you know, Allegheny County obviously is going, probably going to go blue, but it, this type of stuff this close has me pretty nervous. Yeah. With all due respect, due respect to your other guest, Aaron, um, you know, I know he was using Trumbull County, which is not that far from me uh, as a sort of indicator. I mean, the rest of Pennsylvania is very red. Uh, if you spend any time, if you spend any time here, uh, just 20 minutes away from the city. I mean, it's like a freaking cold. It, it's, it's, and whether you drive into Ohio near Trumbull County, you go north of the city, you go east or south of the city. I mean, uh, personally, I, I know I'm supposedly leaves Pennsylvania by five points. I would be shocked if Pennsylvania actually goes for Biden. And if it does, it will be purely on the strength, I think, of the urban centers. Uh, yeah. Because the, uh, the motivation, I mean, and friends of mine too, you know, it's, you know, I know these people, I grew up in the country, um, is, is pretty strong. Wow. Well, listen, um, take down this number, 833-336-8688. Uh -huh. 833-336-8683. -336 That's the uh, Democratic voter hotline. It might be helpful for you to tell them what your situation was. It may provide them for some information going forward. Yeah, I was I was thinking about I I, I was thinking about calling uh, that other place back earlier. Although I assume that they're going to like try and vet any information that they give. But yeah, I got that phone number. So, yeah, yeah. Um, try oh, give, oh. give them a call. It might be helpful for them just to be aware of what the situation is. Sure. I'll I'll, uh, I'll try and call them tomorrow and. Because I'm, I'm really curious to, to see if we get a provisional ballot tomorrow. Yeah, you know, yeah, do that, will you? Call in and let us know how it got, worked out. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. All right. All right, that is the final call of the day. We'll take a couple of IMs and we'll get out of here. So much for doing an early show. Jesus, I can't, I just can't. I just have no discipline. Cyber uh, bullying uh, Joe Kennedy.
Hi from Worcester. I just want to thank you all for helping me understand everything that's been going on since March. I interned with a show Michael Brooks had on Aslan Media while in college. Wow, rest in power. Wow. Uh, and rediscovered MR since the pandemic started. I became a member recently, and I know tomorrow will be a lot less stressful listening to you guys. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's, uh, I remember Michael show on Oslan Media. Ice Team Fur. I, man, I wonder how that violent Trump tuck learned to police maneuver. <laughs> yeah. Majority Report Zach, can you allow <laughs> me to expand on her re-education idea she talked about on the show last week? Is it only conservatives she wants to re-educate or all non-socialists? How would this re-education get reinforced? Hmm. That's an excellent question. I mean, look, my model of transformative justice focuses much more on rehabilitation than on punishment. Um, so my hope is, you know, with the right uh, education, people will uh, realize that it's in their best interests and the best interests of the world to cooperate with uh, some kind of socialist or communist uh, democratic uh, situation. Yeah, and I'm in charge of the English syllabus and uh, you have to read Cloud Splitter before you graduate high school. Magnus uh, Clocklin, chump lovers are the worst people in the world, hands down. Uh, Mo, we doing black magic to keep Bernie alive forever? I'm down, willing to sacrifice maybe my cat, but that's as far as I'll go. Um, Leave the cat alone. Beat the Reaper. Vehicular assault is a felony. Felonies don't have to be witnessed by an officer to make an arrest. That's in enough. some places, apparently, it's not. If it's politically motivated, it's fine. Betsy DeVos, Harris County is Houston, not Austin. Oh, sorry. Uh, can confirm that y'all have said about the raged out truck drivers. Also driving the wrong lane and two lane highways out of the country. A square. Sam, thank God for Wiss Dems. And you guys giving us all day coverage tomorrow on your anniversary too. People don't understand the level of lawlessness that Mad King has gotten away with does not apply to them. Rubio must be desperate because that driver owner of that truck will be charged and sued personally because you know intentional acts are not covered by insurance. Grandstanding Oppression Party. Hey, Janesville, Wisconsin, my city born and raised. I didn't know that they were beefing up security here. Weird. We usually do vote Democrat, but we're still a shit stain with Paul Ryan and now Brian Steele because of Walworth Racine, Kenosha counties, where all the rich Chicago uh, landers live in their fourth homes and brainwash the poor help. Uh, three more. Postman Josh. Seems like the Democrats have lost the integrity of their blue wall due to the right to work laws and diminished union involvement with the right built their version on unions in the evangelical churches. Without a doubt, without a doubt, and not just the blue wall, but just in general. Can the left rebuild the institution of labor? Or is there another place to form an ideological base? If there is another place to form it, I'm not 100% sure what it is. I mean, I think part of the reason why I suspect that Bernie wants to be a uh, labor uh, secretary, and I imagine it, it comes with certain sort of like uh, requirements, is that he, I think he probably feels that it, 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 labor needs to be rebuilt. And, 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 that's, and, and the, that's the way to do it. We can build it back better. I mean, it really is an opening for workers in places where there aren't a lot of laws around unions and there aren't a lot of officially recognized unions to form a, a new kind of union of their own that is totally self-organized, that is not bureaucratic, and that is radical and militant in fighting the bosses. Jedi Duck, wishing well to the MR crew. Remember to drink plenty of water tomorrow. Will do. And the final. I am of the day. Go vote. Go vote. Go vote. Go vote. Marco bragging about Florida drivers acting hard is just actually making excuses for regular 85-year-olds behind the wheel behavior. All right, folks. <laughs> Tomorrow, all day. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught But see the truth of the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better
Yeah, no.